welcome to the Dojo Talk Podcast. Please remove them shoes before entry. The master is here, and you still have not taken off your shoes. Yeah. Living every day to define man's mission yeah. Looking to the sky for divine transmission yeah. Deaf man's vision makes the blind man listen yeah. Eyes on the prize, this is blind ambition Thank you. Welcome to another edition of the Dojo Talk Podcast I'm your host, Serial Sensei We are on episode number 138 As always, you can give this podcast a listen on SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes If you're on iTunes, please rate, subscribe, and leave a review you can also listen to us on Spotify as well as Google Play. Give us a look on social media at the Dojo Talk Podcast Facebook page as well as the Dojo Talk Podcast Instagram page. Send questions to Dojo Talk Podcast at yahoo.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Twitch at Serial Sensei. And of course, as always, I'm joined with my co host, Anta Cool. What's going on, man? Um, not much. Every one of these episodes, like to start with something like a little fresh, a little new. But uh, you know, we just had E3. We did, we're gonna start with that. Ask you your thoughts on it. But I'm I'm too hyped. Cause you know what's next week? What is next week? The greatest fight of our generation. We have the champion, Artem Wobov. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> taking on. <laughs> The Italian stallion himself, Paulie <laughs> Malinaji. I don't let you know that you you uh you're gonna have full responsibility of coverage. <laughs> Bare knuckle fighting championship six. They'll be wearing gloves. They just won't have knuckles. <laughs> that is a real thing. The Florida State Athletic Commission came out and said they had to wear gloves, but they didn't have to wear have knuckles on them. Go figure. Jesus Christ, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, you you guys and your bare knuckle uh festivities. Y'all have I fun. Mean, that is Artem Wobov versus Jason Knight was the best fight of this year. And yes, it was better than Israel at the sign of Kelvin Gaston doing that. <laughs> God. Um uh, uh. And I'm not gonna be able to avoid it. That fight's gonna be all up and down my timeline, so I guess I might as well just I mean I'm not watching, but I'm just gonna have to get used to it. Uh, you know, Embrace it. I bet the bare knuckles here to stay. So, Ugh. Ugh. but you got. How, how are you doing, Sensei? I'm uh, I'm alright. I guess this week's been a little, a little hectic. I'm really tired. I'm not gonna lie. Like not tired. Like I didn't get sleep tired, but tired. Just like I'm like exhausted. But like emotionally spent. Yeah, yeah. It's been a lot going on this week. But looks like it's a nice day outside. Hopefully it doesn't rain. I got caught in the rain the other day while I was driving. It was not fun. It was like that yeah, tor- torrential, like downpour rain. Um, yeah, like when I talked, like when I was talking to my coworker earlier this weekend, and she was like, she asked me what I was gonna do this week. I was like, go, I'm gonna probably go hiking or something. And she told me it's supposed to thunderstorm all weekend long. And now I'm looking at it. I'm like, damn, I'm gonna really drive down to Delaware this afternoon. It's gonna be a thunderstorm. Yeah, yeah, I'll be on the road as well. Um, well, I guess with that being said, because I figure we're both driving for the same reasons, uh, happy Father's Day. Well, it'll be past Father's Day by the time you guys hear this, but happy belated Father's Day to all of the fathers out there. Um, I will be driving to my dad's house sometime later after we record this, Wait. and I need to figure out a uh, dinner plan, because I have to cook. And we got to gotta put up the thing of Mark Bowman. Uh, with his two kids after Fedor beat him up. <laughs> That'll be the picture for that. So, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's a real shame there weren't more heavyweight fights this week or like middleweight fights. Like we, we could have done the whole Tough Dads episode. Ah oh, man, that'd have been a nice Father's Day, <laughs> nice Father's Day dedication. Shout outs to all the shout yeah. to everybody at at 185 and above. See that next year, just nothing but. We're, we're, we're just, if there's a card this weekend on the Father's Day weekend, we're not going to talk about it. We're just going to talk about our best mid-tier middleweight fight of all time. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. Tough, tough dad, tough dad edition episode. 
<laughs> I, I feel like we have that like, like a cutoff for tough uh, t- uh, tough dads. Like you can't be like a top eight fighter and be a tough dad in middleweight. You literally have to be like unranked. Mm, how do you top? You can be at like the bottom of the fifteen, maybe thirteen and back. See, I don't get like a tough dad uh, vibe from like a, a Yoel Romero, so much as like a like a, like that one crazy uncle vibe. You feel me? Where he definitely has kids you don't know about, right? <laughs> but like they don't know him either, so he's not really a dad. <laughs> I guess I figured because middleweight. Middleweight after about the top eight sometimes like, starts to look a little sketchy. Yeah, like Chris Weidman was the only like tough dad in the top of that division, and he's gone now. So yeah, that he had all the dad energy. Well, we'll, we'll figure well, it out. Well, well, we'll him, him and Silva. So Silva was definitely a tough dad. Yeah. Ah oh, boy. Yeah. When when you Wait, when you when you a, lose via your knee going out. Uh, yeah, I think you've hit a. Like Anderson Silva definitely like was a dude who was just like dancing at like all his like daughter's like birthday parties and like embarrassing <laughs> her in front of his her friends. He was at the wedding cutting up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he was definitely at the wedding going off. And yeah, we'll we'll figure out the tough dad like official criteria. Um, but now yeah, there is there there is a lot like that's happened since the last time we recorded. We had E three. The NBA Finals is the NBA season is now wrapped up. Toronto is uh, NBA champions. They took out Golden State. Uh, for anybody who watches hockey, or was it the St. Louis Blues won the uh, Stanley Cup? Um, yeah, there's been a lot going on. A lot going on. Uh, I guess we could spend a little, 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 little smidgen time on on E3 before we uh, jump into the episode. Um. I'm I'm running yeah. this off the off the top of my head because I don't have any of this pulled up. Um, mm-hmm. well, I guess I'll, I'll say for those who don't watch, if if you don't know what E3 is, um, pretty much you know one of the largest video game conferences that happens every year. Normally you have your big three with uh, well, actually no, I can't say big three because normally Nintendo does their own thing, but normally it's a Sony, Microsoft, and then you get all the other developers who have their own conferences and so on and so forth. But this year was a little different because there was no there was no Sony, um, which I think this is like the first time ever that Sony has opted out uh, to do E3. So you had like Microsoft, you had Nintendo, and then you had uh, what else? Bethesda, Ubisoft, Square Enix, um, Activision. Yeah, Activision. They even Wait, did. The um, no, 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 not Activision. Yeah, they did switch it up though, because I think even like PC had a, a show. I didn't watch it, but uh, yeah, they had a gaming show, yeah. which is weird. Because like, who runs the PC gaming show? I have no idea. Like, <laughs> yeah, like who's like, the who's the host? Like who? <laughs> like yeah, because like with Microsoft or Sony or Nintendo, like you know who, or, or even like any of these game publishers, they have like people who are designated for that. But like, who who's the host of the like like do all the like PC game publishers are just like oh. They all get shoveled into, like, one thing yeah, where they get, like, five minutes to talk about their indie game or whatever. Who, who represents the quote-unquote master race? <laughs> oh, e- EA. EA was the other one. That, uh, nah. I forgot. Yeah, they went. They did um, talk about putting, like, uh, what was it, transactions in the NBA 2K or something? I didn't see any of EA's conference except for one thing, and that was the Star Wars game. I didn't see anything else. I heard it was a lot of jumping and climbing, and that was basically it. Cause I liked it though. It <laughs> I saw people saying it looked like Uncharted, and it kind of does. Cause there, there was a lot of jumping, climbing, but I like how they were using the force. You could like move stuff. Uh, you run on walls. Yeah, it looked it looked cool. It looked cool. I'm not saying it's a day one buy. I'm, I'm not saying I'm ready to like you know reserve it and hand over my money, but we haven't gotten like a good Star Wars game in a while, especially one like that, like a one that actually has like a story, not like a shooter or anything like that. So I have hopes that that'll be something. Like that'll it, it look it looks they have my attention at least, so that's good. Um, I mean the conferences overall were cool. I would say the highlights for me, um, like I said, I'm running this off the top of my head. 
I'm not a Microsoft guy, so I'll throw that out there. Um, they had a decent conference, but my only gripe is that a lot of their conferences was like a lot of CGI trailers and not a ton of gameplay, which I kind of wanted to see some gameplay for some of these games because, you know, anybody can make a dope CGI trailer, but your game still might be trash. But, um... Just uh, Fallout 76. <laughs> right? <laughs> like... So CGI trailers don't always do it for me, but just a couple of games I'll throw out there for people if if you want to watch. Um, there was a game called Ghostwire that caught my attention. That was a really really interesting trailer. Um, I know everybody's in love with the woman who uh, who gave the the uh, the, the yeah, host yeah, for yeah, that. yeah I don't remember her name, but yeah, I actually didn't um I didn't watch that uh, part of the conference. I just saw the trailer of the game, but I did see the lady they were talking about. Um, so yeah, Ghostwire looked really, looked really, really interesting. Um, it was a game called Deathloop. It's called Deathloop. It, it was a game where there were two black main characters, and they were like assassins, and that looked really, really interesting. Um, and also, just not often you see two black characters as main characters in a game, and they seem to be like the focal point of whatever that game is. So that that game had my attention. Uh, Cyberpunk 20, 2077. Yes, uh, that looks awesome. That- Based off the, uh, what was it, tabletop game that I did not know existed, uh, Cyber, uh, Cyberpunk 2020. Is it? I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, it Based. looks awesome. Yeah. yeah. It looks it looks really good. And, you know, Keanu Reeves came out, and everybody lost their minds. <laughs> He's really interesting to watch on stage. Somehow, like, it fit him perfectly. Um... But no, yeah, eat that. That was uh, that had my attention. Uh, Doom Eternal looked amazing, um, and that did show a lot of gameplay. So that that game looks like nothing but fun. I mean, uh, Gears... it's Doom. You can't like. There, there's nothing to Doom but gameplay. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like it's nothing. There, there's not a lot of CGI trailer you can show with Doom. You just got to show shooting and then, like this one. Like you can jump around and. They've added, like, extra mechanics that makes it look even more fun. So, yeah, Doom, Doom Eternal looks like a must-have. Um, the Final Fantasy VII remake, I'm not even, like, a huge Final Fantasy guy, but that remake looks really, 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 really good. Um, but it's going to be two Blu-ray discs, which makes me think this game is going to take ages to beat. And I have dedication issues. I mean, so. yeah, the, the original one took forever to beat. I'm like two Blu-rays. That's 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 a lot. That is. Like that, and this is I'm just milking money out you uh, of everybody. Like, like the, all the stuff that they showed in the trailer was from like the first twenty minutes of the game. But so. e- either way, it looks it looks really good. I like how they did the combat system. They it's hard for me to like describe it, so I would just tell people if you're interested, just watch the trailer. But I, I like the the combat system looks pretty fun, um, so yeah that that definitely had me and it was a lot of CGI mixed in with gameplay that that was probably one of the best highlights of the entire like E3, um, and I had a couple of cool indie games that I saw. Um, there was some game I called it the Bambi game. You get to play as like a deer, some little deer adventure game. I don't know. That actually like the I like the art style it looked pretty cool. And there was some other game where I don't remember the name of it, but there was a the main character was. Uh, a black woman, and it was another like 2D indie game, but the art style looked really dope. Uh, I, I know you're talking about. Called. Um, crap, I know this. I know this. I don't know this. <laughs> I, I, I remember the one you saw you were talking about. Yeah, that that looked that looked pretty cool, and I, I like like 2D like platformers and games like that. So that that might give that a look. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. Oh, Nintendo, Nintendo, Nintendo. Um, Astral Chain looks amazing. I'm I'm buying that game. I, I cannot wait to play it. I've heard of this for a while, but that trailer looks so good, so so good. Um, so I can I cannot wait to play Astral Chain. Uh, Banjo Kazooie got announced for Smash Brothers. I'm not a huge Banjo Kazooie fan, but everybody else was like fainting and and they they were all for it. So I'm happy you guys got what you wanted because I know people have wanted to see Banjo Kazooie in Smash for a while. Um, I feel like I'm probably forgetting something, but I mean it was it was cool. Like um, you know, th- it wasn't an amazing conference, but I think they did have like a little bit of something for everybody. Like if you're into RPGs, you definitely got a lot uh, shown, especially from like Nintendo and Square Enix. 
you got got a lot of RPGs. Um, and then if you just wanted to see like the heavy hitters, I think Doom, Doom and Final Fantasy probably gave you a pretty good fix. And then uh, oh, of course you had a they showed Halo. They didn't show gameplay, but cool to see Halo back. Um, <laughs> the Marvel game, which I've seen a lot of mixed. Uh, the Avengers game, I've seen some mixed opinions on that. It looks like it should be out on PlayStation Three. See, I <laughs> I haven't seen the gameplay yet, so I'm gonna have to reserve judgment. Cause I, I think there is a video out there that has gameplay of it, and I know they had gameplay booths there at E3 uh, for people who were there. So I'm gonna have to reserve judgment. Judgment. I have to go back and just watch the gameplay to see if what it looks like. We have I've heard a lot of mixed uh, mixed feelings about that game. Um, but no, nah, E3 e- e- was cool. Um, it was a nice, nice time to spend the weekend, you know, if you were interested, you know, all, all of it's on YouTube now, you can go watch the conferences separately, so you don't have to sit through the whole thing at once, just find what you're interested in and go look at that, but, um, no, I thought, I thought E3 was cool, I, I enjoyed it, um, and real quick, I have to mention the NBA Finals again, because I'm $35 richer now, well, I haven't been paid yet, so, I'm not technically $35 richer yet, or richer yet, but, will be come Tuesday, I want to go back to work. So shout out to the Toronto. That was actually that that was an awesome. That was an amazing game six. Um, I didn't want to stay up because I had to work early the next morning, but I watched the first half and just the game was so back and forth that I just I had to keep watching and it was it was entertaining down to the very 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 last second. Um, I hate Golden State, <laughs> but I never you know you don't want to see people get injured. So I hope KD and Clay. Are, are doing all right. Well, well, kind of sucks. I think we know KD's gone for next season. I think that's pretty much been confirmed. I don't know how long Clay is going to be out for, but he tore his ACL. And shout out to him, man. Clay was playing his heart out. He was lighting Toronto up before. I think he had like thirty something before he left, and that was just in like the first half. Um, but no, it was an amazing game six. Shout out to Toronto for really gutting out that win. Uh, it was, it was awesome. Great, great way to end the season. I'm really excited for the off season. I'm really excited for the draft. The Lakers are already making moves. They just made a trade. So they got Anthony Davis. They I think they got rid of Lonzo, Ingram, Josh Hart, and like three first-round picks. So we'll have AD and LeBron playing together next season. That's going to be interesting to watch. I'm interested to see what the rest of that roster is going to look like, though. Because they gutted so many people. But they did keep Kyle Kuzma, so that's that's a good thing. So we'll, we'll see how the Lakers look. Um, so yeah, I don't know, a lot, just a lot of sports stuff going on. Uh, real quick, before I forget, uh, shout outs to the listeners, as always, any guy, all you guys reposting, sharing on Tumblr, on Twitter, wherever you are, we appreciate you. Uh, number one city for the week was Sydney, Florida, number two, Carlsbad, California, number three, San Francisco, California, number four, Dallas, Texas, and number five, Atlanta, Georgia. So thank you guys for listening, for sharing. As always, share with everybody, coworker, friend, grandma, girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, person who cut your grass, uh, people who come install your cable, all of them. Just tell them, tell them to listen. We need, we need, we need their ears. Um, oh, and real quick, they didn't make the top uh, five, but I see you, Cairo, Egypt. Uh, where, where are you at? Number 11. <laughs> so, I feel like we made fun of them for a week and then they came back. So, shout outs to, uh, to Cairo, Egypt. Alrighty then. So, that was our uh, intro banner. So, we do have a, a good number of fights to talk about. Uh, today, we'll be covering a little bit of one championship. Uh, pro- probably just literally a few fights off of that card because... I don't think either of us watched it. I honestly forgot it was even a thing until like that morning that it came on. But we'll give a little brief mention of that. Uh, we'll talk about <laughs> this uh, Brightest versus uh, Glowacki fight, which was... Um... Fight of the year. <laughs> it was something. It, it was something. It was... Uh... That... that... Well, I, I don't know these gentlemen, so I, I, this would be wrong. I'm, I'm going to say that the the names aren't important, you know, because I'm pretty sure any, any, you know, some people hearing this, listening, probably may not know either of these gentlemen. 
knowing them isn't important. It's knowing what happened in this fight that is of the of the utmost importance that that needs to be uh, analyzed. <laughs> but we'll cover that. Uh, we'll talk about Tyson Fury and the uh, Tom Schwartz fight, which only lasted two rounds, and then we'll finish off with uh, Bellator 222. Um, but before we get into that, as always, got to start with the news, uh, fight news and announcements. Uh, so, uh, just running from the top, a little decent, decent bit of fights, not too many, but a couple of not notable ones that I wrote down. Uh, probably the biggest fight that got announced during this past week, Jessica Andrade will be back defending her strawweight title against Wei Li Zhang. Um, is this, oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. no, go ahead, go ahead. And this is in, this is going to be in China, right? And this is not on a pay per view. I believe. No, it's going to be in China. It's going to be on ESPN Plus, um, mainland China. It's in Shen, uh, what is it? Shenzhen, Shenzhen, Shenzhen. Uh, my Mandarin sucks. But uh, yeah, no, mainland China, and it's going to be at ESPN Plus. There we go. So um, is it ESPN? No, I think it's ESPN Plus. I have no idea how they would work out um, getting that on a suitable time on TV. Yeah, time zone difference would be would be kind of wild. Yeah, but uh, I I really like this fight. I saw some people who were not fans. Um, they're the, weird. The debate, <laughs> the, the the debate seems to be between uh Whaley Zhang or and whether or not that Michelle Waterson deserved that spot. Um, I mean I, I get the Waterson argument. I don't explain it to me. <laughs> I, I I think part of it is recency bias. Because the lot we've seen her fight. When, when was her um? Ah, who who did she beat? Terry Nicole Volkovich in March. Yeah. Ah, so that was a while. Ago. I don't know why I thought that fight was sooner than that. But I, I went and looked at their last three opponents. Um. I don't know. Like I get it. People like Waterson. I don't know. Like I uh. I get it, kind of, but I, and I could be wrong here, um, Zhang's last opponent was Torres, and Waterson's last po opponent was Carolina, I don't know who was ranked higher between those two, but I do know, like, wasn't Torres just coming off, um, a fight with Andrade before then? Uh, yeah, no, it was with, uh, Joanna and Jacek. Oh, yeah, 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 Joanna, not Andrade, yeah, Joanna. But either who, like, I don't, I don't, I, I get it, I guess, if you're a Waterson fan, like, you know, you're going to argue for your fighter, I get it, but, can't, like, act like Wei, because I feel like people are, like, just acting like Wei Li Zhang is just kind of some, like, nobody, like, she hasn't been out here putting in work. I think and, people forget that, like, Jisha Torres beat Michelle Waterson. Right, and, you know, MMA math doesn't always add up, but, you know. Tisha beat Wa Tisha beats Waterson and then Jane beats Tisha, and and what was a really fun and impressive fight, you know. And if if we're not going with a Thug Rose rematch, which obviously we are now, but you know you, you start looking at who's really next in line. It's not like she wasn't up there. Like I feel like some people are just treating her like she just magically leapfrogged the rest of the division. It's like nah, she's kind of been here. She's, she's been here. Um, this wasn't just some random name they threw out a hat. Now I get it. Like some people are saying, oh, they're only they're only putting her in there because they're trying to expand into the Chinese market, which that could definitely be a part of it. I'm not gonna dismiss. Yeah, it that. absolutely is. But like, she's ready. But it's to not go. like, yeah. And is ready to go. Suarez's neck is hurt. Rose's neck is hurt. Goodell is coming off a loss. Joanna's one in three in her last four and. Lord knows if she's even trying to make straw weight anymore. Um, and the answer off is coming off a of loss. Like, those are all the women ranked above her. All right. And I can see if Zhang, like, wasn't out here winning. But it's not like she hasn't been putting in the work. Right. Like, this wasn't sort of just some random name they drew out of a hat and was like, all right, just give her the title shot. Like, nah, she's, she's earned this spot. Like, um, I don't want to, like, I like Michelle Waters and everything. Do, do you want to see her get tossed on her head like Rose did? <laughs> that's what would happen. Yeah, I, I said it last podcast. He's gonna go for one of them little judo throws, and uh, like, yeah, this is 
the only instant. I can remember of Dana Way ever protecting a fighter when he has to go into the Endeavor offices and explain where if they make their girl, Michelle Waterson, who is one of Endeavor's like clients, fight with Jessica Andrade, she might come home without a head. Yeah, it, it, that fight could get... And I mean, she's going to get the fight eventually, I feel like. Because she's, you know, she's... She, she's at the top. She, she's up there in that conversation. So I have no doubt that she'll find herself in a title fight. And I'm a fan of hers. So, so you're more whether, confident in her than I am. Well, I, I think she can get there. I don't know if she'll win. I actually know it, to be honest. I'm, if Andrade's champ, I, you, if your chances are very, are very slim. Because I, I look at the matchup of her and Andrade, and I don't really see where... She holds like an advantage, because um, you're maybe, not gonna be able to just toss and drive around like that. Yeah, like maybe she can sub her off her back, but like if she's on her back, she's probably got there by being tossed there, not taken down. Right. <laughs> you either got tossed or you got rocked. Either way, it's not gonna be a good time. I, I would say in the meantime, well, I, I don't know, um, injuries permitting. Um, a Waterson and, and um, uh, what's the name fight? Joanna. Waterson, Joanna, or Waterson and um, Suarez. Well, that's the thing, though. We don't know. Like, so the one of the reasons Suarez didn't get this fight is because she hurt her neck in the uh, the Ansarov fight, and her neck is as like one of the reasons she had to stop wrestling. Yeah. So uh, we we don't know if um. You know, we don't know if there's like a timetable for her to come back. Like, don't forget, like Rose Namajunas missed most of 2018 because of her neck injury. Like, like you you don't play with that type of stuff. Yeah. So, according to like she said, like after the first round, her like her what like I think it was her right side was just completely numb. Like she just could not feel it. So, that's a scary thought. And, I mean, if she has to be, and uh, I feel like that kind of goes to the point I was making earlier. If she's going to be out, then Waterson will probably get that title shot. She's going to at least be in that conversation. Just mm-hmm. via, she's been winning and availability. Like, she'll be available if they want to make that fight. Right. But, we'll, we'll see. I, I like the Andrade Jang matchup. Um, I'm rooting for Jang really hard. I don't know if she'll win. Um, I, I, think, I will I say that. I think she's a tougher opponent than people are giving her credit for. Yeah, because I think aside from Andrade, she probably is one of the like the physically strongest uh, fighters in that division. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think at, at the very least, and not not to compare, but Zhang, Zhang and Torres are somewhat similar. I think we saw that when they fought. They they they, they are somewhat similar, and Torres was able to give Andrade a, a pretty competitive fight. Um, that is the first part of it. Yeah. So maybe Zhang can do that and just improve on it. Um, I, I think she'll be able to make it competitive. She'll be able to hang until, you know. We'll, until we'll she's see. not anymore. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so, so she's not hanging anymore. But no, I, I think she'll make it a competitive fight. Um, cause they're, they're both they're both like stupid strong. But Andrade kind of has like that next level strength, but we'll we'll, we'll see what Zhang can do. I, I think she will make it competitive, but that that's gonna be an awesome fight. Um, at UFC San Antonio, we have Leon Edwards versus Rafael dos Anjos, as well as Alexander Hernandez versus Francisco Trinaldo. Uh, speaking of Tisha Torres at UFC uh, Uruguay, we'll have Tisha Torres versus Marina Rodriguez, and your homie Enrique Barzola versus Bobby Moffitt. Um, at UFC Vancouver, we'll have David Branch versus Andrew Sanchez, and also Uriah Hall versus Antonio Carlos Jr. And at UFC 241, we will have Poliana Botelho and versus Marina Morose, and Sabina Mazo will be making her return against Shayna Dobson. Um, so that's pretty much all the fight announcements I have. Uh, there, there were a couple more, but I, they were they weren't like crazy big fights, so I, I didn't yeah. write them down. They're fighting announcements every week. Let's be real. Yeah. Almost every but, day at this point. 
of, of those I named, uh, aside from Andrade and Jang, definitely looking forward to Edwards and Dos Anjos. Um, I like the Torres Rodriguez fight. The first time we saw Rodriguez, she uh, she threw a lot of hands, a lot of hands. So I think that should be a fun fight. Uh, and of course, the goat Dave Branch, he got to bounce back. <laughs> you got, you got. We got to get back, get back to winning ways. He would have um, fought for the title already if he had been that way heavyweight. Yeah. Uh, well, life, life happens. <laughs> but that's all I got for uh, flight announcements. But on to news. Um. So I have three bits of news written down. Uh, well, you want to start with Cyborg, TJ, or Endeavor? Um, still a cyborg, just get out the way real quick. Alright, so, I mean, it's not really a large news story, but, uh, pretty much after Cyborg's next fight with Felicia Spencer, excuse me, which, that happened in July? August? July. Yeah, uh, after her fight with Felicia Spencer... Actually, I shouldn't uh, say that so confidently if I don't know. One second. I don't know if it's one of those two, but either who, after her next fight with, uh, Felicia Spencer... Uh, Chris Cyborg says she will be testing free agency. Um, I just thought this was interesting of note because we've kind of talked about this before that Cyborg has done pretty much, I guess, everything you would want to do in this sport. Um, the only reasons for her at this point to really come back to the UFC would be either one, Try to get your, your rematch with Nunez and try to run that back and avenge the loss. I mean, really, that's it. Like, because <laughs> aside from Nunez, there's not, especially at 45, there's nobody else really to, you know, nobody else really to throw fisticuffs with, at least in the UFC. So, you know, it's just interesting to see. I'm interested to see, like, where she'll go. I'm, I'm pretty sure in free agency, she will have people knocking at her door um even with the Nunez loss she's still one of the most recognizable faces um in MMA the most recognizable face at 45 um I don't know where she goes I mean if you go to Bellator I don't know what you fight like Julia Budd <laughs> um, basically uh, yeah Julia Budd Olga Rubin um I, I guess they could do like a Ju, uh, the not Julie Kitchen, um, Jarena Bars rematch in their Bellator kickboxing promotion. Hmm. If that's still a thing, who knows anymore? All right. Um, I mean, with Bellator, she at least had the freedom to go like box because I know that's something she wanted to do. Um, yeah, that, yeah. Because you could fight, you could fight Bud and be a champ. Still go out and you know box, kickbox. Do, 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 do whatever, do whatever and, fight endeavors your heart desires. And she could go fight in um, Japan. Because yeah. it seems like Bellator is pretty open about uh, doing cross-promotion with Ryzen. Cyborg and Ryzen. Rob <laughs> Ryzen would give her some wild matchups. <laughs> um, like, I, I don't know, like, one, I guess? I don't know who they match her with. Like, they, they have trouble stacking that, like, that flyweight division that is basically a strawweight division, but I guess they could just pull the random, like, 170-pound woman out of Russia, because there are a couple of them fighting in Russia right now. Um, she mentioned that she was open to doing wrestling. I, I, I don't know how well her athleticism carries over into uh, pro wrestling, but that's an option for her, apparently. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's gonna be interesting. Her her career, it it well, I, I don't know. That, and that, that's why I wrote this down because it's kind of hard to tell that her. We don't really know where her career is kind of headed at this point. Like she she has options, but it's just kind of you know which way are you really trying to go? If you stick with MMA, I, I feel like Bellator is probably the probably the best move because you can go to Bellator, most likely become champ. Um. And still kind of be able to do what you want outside of Bellator. Like you said, you could still, you could box, you could kickbox, you could fight in Ryzen. Because, uh, you know, Coker kind of lets his fighters, he, you know, they can kind of do their thing outside of Bellator. 
So I feel like that would be a good option. Um, yeah, or you could go wrestle. I don't know. She just she she has options. She she does have options, and I, I think we all knew at some point the UFC thing was only going to last but so long just because of how thin that division is in general. And so, how much yeah. animosity there is between Cyborg and the promotion. Right. <laughs> so, we all knew this was, this day was coming, but now it's like, oh, right, well, now we're like, we're almost here. Um, I, I think that, I, I think it just comes down to what happens in the, uh, the Amanda Nunez Holly Holm fight. Because Nunez has been pretty open about uh, wanting to rematch Cyborg, I think. Um, she came out and said she wanted that fight again. Um, and that's probably the biggest fight they could do for her. They, like, if they plan on keeping this 145 division around for a while, if uh, Nunez just blows through Holly Holm um, this summer, like, Cyborg is little like, like, the Cyborg rematch is basically what they have left for her. Until they can get Aspen Ladd or Irene Aldana or I guess Jermaine Durand to me, like, re- uh, not ready, but like media ready for like a title shot. All right. I guess though, if, and I, I don't know what Cyborg's mindset is during all this, I think she's looking for some, maybe something new on top of just some consistency. Right. So it's like if I, if I, if you go in. And you beat Spencer, like I, I think we're all predicting would happen. Then it's like, all right, I wait maybe for the winner of Holly Nunez, especially if it's Nunez. But then it's like, if I do the Nunez fight, it re- really, if I win or lose, or I guess if you win, you do a trilogy. I, I guess you that would probably be the move. Um, but it just seems like no matter what she does in the UFC, like there's not a lot left. Like outside of Nunez, and I. I I like Holly, but I don't really know if I care to see them fight again. I mean, I would watch, but I'm not like clamoring for that fight. Like, there's enough. There were enough like really bizarre, dumb takes about Holly Holm being robbed that I see, I could see the UFC being like, "Yo, we need to run this <laughs> fight back again." Yeah, yeah, I just, yeah. And then you know, just just to throw the alternate uh, reality out there, hypothetically speaking, if Spencer wins somehow um i don't know i think she just probably just wipes her hands clean i mean if you go from losing to the champ to losing to spencer who's you know a good fighter in her own right but i I don't know i just i don't know i I feel like if i don't know i I see i see her leaving either way unless the nunez fight just becomes a thing because outside of that I, i don't really see her motivation to even stay But I don't know. We'll we'll we'll, we'll see. I wouldn't mind seeing her uh, over in Bellator or the Arena Bars fight. Actually, would be I w- I would love to see them fight again. And Probably it could, just it could be what they need to get that free, that Bellator kickboxing moving or like just get people to freaking watch it. Right. <laughs> Probably be the, one of the no, it probably would be the biggest fight that that Bellator kickboxing would ever have. Yep. And it would be good to just get some eyes on uh, Irina Bars. If you guys haven't seen her fight, she's she's awesome. She's uh, she's really, really good. So, But, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how Chris Cyborg, uh, what she does with free agency. That, that'll be happening pretty soon. Um, you want to cover the Endeavor? Like, I, I knew about it, but I didn't really uh, read into it. And, and he, There's not a bunch to talk about right now. Um... Endeavor is in talks with Al Heyman to buy the PBC and have him stay on in a um, his advisory role, where he's an advisor to basically all the fighters on the PBC roster. Um, I don't like monopolies. Like, and one company owning seventy five percent of the combat sports landscape just seems like a recipe for like bad. Um, yeah, no, I don't like, I, I really don't like that. Um, yeah, there's, there's, not, there's not a lot left to say until we find out what, um, Endeavor is looking to sink into it. 
or what they're trying to do with it, or who they hire to replace Heyman as the promotional figurehead. Uh, if they hire anybody, they might just keep Heyman on in that role. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, I, I I don't like it. I really don't. <clears throat> so with this, well, like I said, it's kind of hard to tell because we don't really know what they're doing with it. But is this <laughs> what Zoo for Boxing was gonna be? I guess. I, I I assume Zufa Boxing was a thing that Dana White was going to do on his own. But he got into somebody's ear at Endeavor and they just started looking at, like... A, a, so, a, Endeavor's finances are bad. Like, they are in a bad spot right now. They're... Um, I, it, it, I, I wish I had the report in front of me. Like, the UFC is basically one of the few Endeavor properties that is actually making money. Um... I don't know if you heard about the strike, the uh, the talent strike that was going on earlier this year. That hit Endeavor. Um, like a whole bunch of people left. It's crazy. There's a, there's, there was a, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Point being, they're not making the money they thought they'd be making. Um, sans the UFC. Apparently, the, the UFC, like, the way the, the pay structure is broken up, Endeavor doesn't actually get that much. Like, it's broken up between, like, a bunch of the smaller financiers, uh, financiers, like, who get a larger percent of the money. So, my theor- my theory is that uh, Endeavor is looking to do the same thing with the PVC, and it's just a way to keep their investors happy, as opposed to make Endeavor money. So, I don't know. I don't know. Well, we'll keep an eye on it. Like you said, not, not a ton of details have really been uh, released or flushed out, so it's kind of hard to speculate even what's going to happen, but we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Um, and the last news story, uh, TJ Dillashaw, he, uh, he's back in the news. Uh, he was on Chael Sonnen's podcast, who uh, another guy we'll be talking about later, <laughs> but uh, this is, I think, pretty much like TJ, TJ's first kind of like big I guess you could say, like, interview after he's, or since he's been suspended. Um, so I'm going to read a uh, quote uh, from uh, Sure Dog, written by Cole Shelton. Uh, so I'm just going to read a little bit of this. So basically, TJ was on uh, Chael Sonnen's podcast. And just to read some of the quotes, uh, he said, uh, Let's start off. First and foremost, I cheated. Uh, I don't want to run around that. That's why I even announced it when USADA was coming out. I didn't want to create excuses. And then he goes on to say, um, I decided to take something I knew I wasn't allowed to take. Uh, it's called Procrit. It's an anemia medication that would help me not only make the weight, but be myself. And you know, <laughs> I'm not mad at it because I don't think I could have taken the fight. I'm obviously gonna own, going to own up to that. Going, ah, going to own up that I cheated. I got caught. It's a rough one, man. It's hard not to hate yourself a little bit. I don't know. It's a tough one. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, pr- pretty much in, in a nutshell from what I'm reading from this article, he basically just took the whatever Procrit is to kind of help him, I guess, safely make the weight and, like, still be able to be TJ. Uh, obviously, it didn't work, <laughs> as, as we saw. But that's pretty much the, the gist of it. Um I don't know, not, not really a lot to unpack, because, I mean, the results of the situation have already been handed down. We're, we're not going to see TJ for two years, but, I don't know, he came out, he said what he did. I'm, I'm at least happy that he didn't give a, you know, a lot of dudes give some crazy wild stories, like, oh, uh, I, I don't know. Some guy you know. injected me in the locker room and right. <laughs> tell me what it was for. Yeah, some ran, some fan ran by me on the street and stabbed me with a needle. <laughs> like, you know, he didn't give some crazy lavish excuse. You know, so I, I I respect that he at least came out and said, you know, yeah, I did it. It is, you know, I, I did it. Here's why I did it, and you know, it sucks that I did it, but this is kind of just what happened. So at least on that front, I I, I can respect it. Um, Boy, did that not work, though. Was it really worth it? And then, <laughs> it's kind of wild, because I saw this floating around on Twitter. But it kind of makes you think, 
uh, rewinding time back to when, uh, you know, everybody wanted Demetrius Johnson to go up and fight uh, TJ, or for TJ to come down and, and fight Mighty Mouse. And DJ was like, yeah, you know, we can take the fight, but I'm going to need some more money, and, um, you know, because we don't know if he can make the weight, blah, 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 so on and so forth. And people said DJ was ducking, and, you know, all that stuff. And then this happened. So, DJ was right. <laughs> Had he taken that fight, I imagine the same thing would have happened. And it would have been a, a whole fiasco. But, I don't know. Any, you got, got any thoughts on on, on Dillashaw? Uh, not really. I mean, easy to make a ton, a ton of excuses. Or maybe the story was an excuse. Maybe he's been taking EPO the entire time and just never got caught. And his excuse was, oh, I was trying to make 125. Um, like we knew it was a bad fight before the UFC made it. So, you know. I, like, I, I don't really, like, it is, it is what it is. Like, I, I don't belabor the point too much because, like, like, like the Diaz brothers say, Everybody is on steroids, so. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it is what it is, but I just wanted to throw that out there, just in case people didn't know. But that's uh, pretty much it for news and notes for the week. So, let's move on to some fights. Um, I want to start with one championship, just to kind of get it out the way, because we're not really going to spend much time on this at all. Um, but one championship did have a card that went down very early Saturday morning. Uh, one championship, legendary quest. Um, couple of notable fights. Uh, the main event was a uh, non-stomp, uh, non-stop fair text, right? Uh, non. Is that is? They, they just have a list as non-stop on topology. So, but I think you're right. I think it is fair text. Yeah. Uh, Nonstop took on uh, Alma Juniku, if I'm saying that correct. Uh, this is a Muay Thai bout at uh, 115 pounds. Um, I did not get a chance to see the fight. Um, Nonstop got the nod, but from what I've been he hearing through the Twitter streets, through the grapevine, uh, that this was a, a bad decision. I cannot confirm nor deny either way, but I saw a lot of people saying they did not agree with this decision at all. But either way, Nonstop. Uh, but she was well, she she was already champ, correct? Yes. I want to say yeah. So she retained her belt, um, but I have to go back and watch the fight because I didn't get a chance to see it, so I can't really. Well, I didn't see any of these fights I'm gonna mention because I didn't know the car it was a thing until Saturday morning. But I was at work, so couldn't really watch it, and it was on Bleacher Report, which I'm not paying for. <laughs> but um, yeah. So nonstop uh, retained her uh her title, uh the co-main event, uh the debut, Sexyama. Yoshihiro Akiyama uh, took on Agalon Thani. Uh, from the clips that I saw, this fight looked like it was really fun. Uh, but Thani ended up getting the unanimous decision. Uh, from the clips I saw, it looked like a nice, fun, you know, just middleweight, fist-to-cuff fight. <laughs> you know, one of those, uh... I don't know, Thani's not a tough dad, because he's, he's pretty young, isn't he? I want to say he's... Still in, like, his 20s, I want to say. Akiyama's definitely a dad, though. He, he's in the 40 year old. Oh, yeah, range. no, he, he is a kid and everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, like he's, he's married to, like, an idol. Yeah, <laughs> so he's, he's he's living the best of the tough dad life. Uh, but he took an L. Um, like I said, I can't really give specifics because I didn't see it, but from the highlights, it looked like a fun fight, so I'll have to go back and uh, check this one out. And then I guess just to... Oh, they don't have this separated by main card. Do they? They do not. So I don't know where the main card stops and the other one ends. But other fights on here. Uh, uh, had a kickboxing bout. Chen Lanzong. He's from Glory, right? I feel like he fights in Glory. I looked it up. I feel like he is from Glory. But Chen Lanzong uh, fought Tyler Hodcastle. Uh, he won via KO in the first round. 
Uh, another Muay Thai bout, Hanzin Hao versus Andrew Miller. Uh, Hanzi Hao won via TKO in round two. And last fight I'll mention, only because I actually remember his name. Oh, Anderson Silva was on this card. Oh, he lost. Radek. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot, because he's uh, over in one now. Yeah, Anderson Silva, not Anderson Anderson, but kickboxing Anderson Silva. Uh, he lost to Tariq Cabez uh, via unanimous decision. And do to do. Oh, the other fight I wanted to mention, uh, Koyomi uh, Matsushima. Uh, defeated um, Kwan via decision. I just remember Matsushima <laughs> from the uh, the Gaffroff fight. I think that was like his debut. All and right. He got, yeah, he came in and he got <laughs> he got Gaffroff out of there. So glad to see him win because he's, he's a new face over in one, and you know might be somebody to, to possibly keep an eye on. So shouts to him. Um, that's pretty much it for one championship. Um, I'm gonna let you handle. This next fight, the uh, the brightest and uh, <laughs> Glowaki uh, spectacle. All right. <laughs> but before we get to the fight of the year, um, brightest versus Glowaki. Uh, let me how to let's, real quick the other. Uh, <clears throat> I guess you could call it the co-main event of this fight. Um, so the World Boxing Super Series Cruiserweight Tournament uh, had its semifinals on was it, it was Saturday? So yeah, Saturday. Um, the two uh, semifinal bouts were Uniel Dorticos versus Andrew Tabidi and Maris Bridas versus I'm not Christoph Glovaki. Um, <clears throat> the Dorticos Tabidi fight was ugly. Uh, Tabidi looked like he was just not ready for this level of a fight, like. Headbutting, grabbing, pulling the head down, just like did everything he could to stop Dorothy Ghost from coming forward. Um, did not work. Ended up getting knocked out in the 10th round. And there's an over, um, not uh, like a little, uh, there's a photo of him split, like an overhead shot of him splayed out on the canvas. That, oh, that, uh, it's the type of thing only boxing can give us. It, it looks like a Renaissance painting. But uh, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna send it to you real quick. But uh, I have to send it to Messenger though, cause you know, it's on my phone. Send. All right, there you go. He is just. That is a man. That is a man who uh, who had a rough night. Oh my. <laughs> yeah. No, it was uh. Yeah, no, it was Gee. a rough night for Mr. T uh, Tabidi. Um, I later found out that he took a picture with Drake like the week before and posted on Instagram, so the Drake tur uh, curse continues. Oh, it worked for Toronto. They overcame it somehow. Well, it only worked for Toronto because Drake doesn't have any of their players tattooed on his body like he does with <laughs> Durant and Steph Curry. <laughs> this picture looks like one of those videos that starts off like, Bet you're wondering how I got here. It all started. <laughs> it all started when I signed the bout agreement. Jesus. Yeah. But this is great a picture, though. It is a yeah. It's, I, I love overhead photos. I wish we had more of them. Um. But um, this was not the uh, craziest thing to happen on this card. Uh, in the other semifinal, we had the local the local man. Um, I want to say he was Lat he's Latvia's first world champion. Um, Myra Baitis versus uh, Christoph Glovaki. Um, it was three rounds of just complete and other like, chaos in the <laughs> best and worst way possible. Um, in the second round, Glovaki get, uh, hits Brightus with a rabbit shot, uh, a shot behind the head. Uh, from the clinch position, uh, not even the clinch position. He, he like it was like an overhand right that he just turned into a hammer fist and brought down on Bryce's head. The the ref, not even bothering to call it, just separates them. They tie up again, and Bryce delivers the most metal world piece back elbow <laughs> across Kavaki's jaw that knocks Kavaki down. The ref takes a point, 
but not before telling Glavaki to get the fuck up. <laughs> no type of sympathy whatsoever. It was kind of shocking to watch happen in real time. Oh, I forgot to mention, before the fight, this fight was refereed by a Robert Bird, who many of you probably know as Adelaide Bird's husband. If you know who Adelaide Bird is, uh, go watch the first Canelo Glovkin fight. Yeah, and listen to the scorecards very carefully. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, Robert Bird, before the fight, goes, uh, as they're having their little thing in the, mid- the middle of the ring, basically says, you're both big guys, I'm not getting in there to stop you. When I say stop, stop. Um, so, you know, it was that type of refereeing. And this is really important for what happens at the end of the second round. But back to Govaki getting just elbowed like the shit out of like in uh, like he he's forcing it up like twenty seconds later he gets knocked down by Brightus. Obviously, this man is not well. He 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 was not. He might have been concussed from the back elbow. Um, but whatever, he manages to get up. Uh, he gets on steady feet and starts, like, you know, exchanging in the pocket with Brightus. The bell rings. Uh, Bird does not hear the bell ring, apparently. And they continue the fight for, like, another 10 to 15 seconds. <laughs> and they're just slugging. <laughs> they are swanging. Like, both guys' corners hop onto the apron in an effort to get the referee's attention. So that he stops the bout and they can go to their corners. And Bird finally, finally noticing that the bell has been ringing for like, hat like a quarter of a minute now, tries to step in, but Brightus proceeds to knock Glavaki down. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, everybody's just losing their fucking mind. The commentator, the audience. Oh, that commentator was heated. <laughs> corner. Robert Bird proceeds to count, uh, count, uh, give the give Govaki the eight, uh, Govaki the eight count. Goes to the guy in the be- who's doing the bell and proceeds to blame him for not ringing it loud enough. He said, "He said, uh, I, I want to say, and I quote, I, I can't call it if I can't hear it.'" <laughs> Something like that. Right. Um, mind you, literally everybody else in the arena heard it. The common uh, I don't know the name of the commentator uh, the commentator crew, um, but one of the commentators was very clear. I can hear it. Just really loudly. Um and Brightus apparently could hear it because he's like uh, immediately after the fight, while they're giving his interview, he's like, No, I can hear the bell. <laughs> I, so you know, it was just like it was one of those instances where maybe you shouldn't have the seventy-eight-year-old man refereeing the fight between the two two hundred-plus pound uh, bombers, who's willing to get in there and separate them in these instances of uh, yeah, chaos and dysfunction. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, the fight wouldn't go on for much longer. Govaki would end up getting knocked out in the next round on the uh, like 30 seconds in. Uh, Brightus is through to the final. He will be facing Dorticos unless the World Boxing Super Series is like, yeah, no, we can't allow this shit. Uh, that that fight just... That fight didn't count anymore. <laughs> you guys have to run it back. And Robert Bird is not allowed to be the referee. Um, apparently Robert Bird got banned from Latvia for, from roughing in Latvia. I'm not sure if that's true or who's somebody like taking the piss, but I like to believe it's true. Um, yeah, no, what just wackiness? Like, it, it, <clears throat> when the rules aren't followed in combat sports, it just becomes a street fight and a circus. And you gotta appreciate these moments of just the veneer being ripped off of what's actually happening in the ring. Uh, I'll put this on Twitter, man. Good gift that keeps giving. Yep. It's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> these these little moments you have to treasure. These 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 are these are little gems. Yeah. Uh, which is fucking uh, just lunacy, lunacy. Um, 
I'm, I'm excited for the final. Brightus is fun. Dorticos is fun. It should make for a uh, fun scrap. I actually like all the World Boxing Super Series finals. They got uh, Reggie Price versus Josh Taylor. Um, now, now you're in way versus whoever he's about to knock the fuck out. Um, and now they got Dorticos and Brightus. And there's a nice little three P. So if you're looking for, if you guys a uh, the zone description uh, subscription for the rest of the year, you got three fights to look forward to. That's uh. Hopefully, just get referees that can hear bells from here on out. You you mean someone who probably doesn't need the assistance of a hearing aid? <laughs> it was, and it, it just looks so bad because like, I'm not gonna lie. In real time, when the bell first rung, I didn't hear it. I think I was so focused because they were still fighting, so I was just looking at fight like, oh, they're really like, like I said, they were swinging, swinging, like they were going for the fences. And then probably about five seconds later, I was like, oh, that sounds like a fire alarm. Like, <laughs> like, it just, the bell was ringing, like, and it kept going off. And it just, yeah, it was, it was, it's like something out of a movie. Like, the villain's, like, having his dirty moment. Mm-hmm. So he just keeps fighting after the bell is over. That's exactly what this looked like. But, um, hey, man, you know, I guess you, you fight until the ref tells you to stop. So I'm not going to blame him. Because, I mean, it's not like the other guy was going to stop swinging, so, yeah. So, neither uh, one of them was going to stop swinging. Gray fought this so. weekend, and he was not the most chaotic man in the ring. Like, that that's crazy to me. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was actually a little more, you know. I know, I lost sense. Fight. No, no. Web. I would say no, no, no uh, fights broke out in the crowd. Oh, there he is. Hello? Yep. He, he disappeared for like a, like a solid 30 seconds. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's all good. Hopefully it got us. Well, we'll still hear people. Hopefully y'all still hear us. But, um, nah, yeah, I was, uh, just saying, yeah, like, Tyson Fury, his fight, no no fights broke out in the crowd. He didn't... I mean, the, the fight, fight didn't go tamed. long enough for him a fight to break out in the crowd, which is surprising. That is true. Yeah, because if you wanted to fight during his fight, then you needed to punch somebody in the jaw like right after the bell rung because uh he didn't give you much time so yeah we'll just move on to the uh tyson fury and uh tom sports fight uh, i watched this this morning i couldn't stay up last night i was tired i was old i went to sleep but um won't won't take you guys too long to rewatch this fight didn't last all that long um pretty much in the first round you know fury came out doing his little dr eggman he literally is like 90% leg. It's kind of wild. But first round, I feel like he just kind of touched up. You know, if you've seen Fury, you kind of know lots of lots of movement. Um, kept Tom at range. Touched him up with a jab. Caught him with a couple one-twos. It, it was a feel-out round, but you still kind of got the sense like, all right, Swartz. He's, uh, you're not getting a ton done here. And he's kind of just, it felt like Fury was just like getting warmed up. Like he was, uh. He was doing like a test run. Like, all right, let me see if this guy's actually going to do anything. And then second round comes. And then Tyson Fury switches to Southpaw. And then <laughs> he, just, he just starts mauling Swartz. I ain't going to say mauling, but he, he starts, uh, what's, what's the word? Schooling, um, toying with... Um, I don't call it a mauling because it, it wasn't, like, vicious, but it was more so, like, I know I'm better than you. Like, you're not, we're not, we're not doing the same sport right now. Right, yeah, you don't really belong in here. So, I'm going to switch to Southpaw, and I'm going to have fun. And, boy, did he start boxing Swartz up, man. No, uh, like, he knocked him out from Southpaw. <laughs> like, he, he, he caught him with that uppercut probably, like, four times. The the one twos did start to get a little harder, and then anytime Swartz thought he had something going, Fury hit the Matrix defense on him, where he just kind of one shoulder, other rope shoulder, a... like along the ropes. He there's there's a sequence in the middle of the second round where Schwartz has Fury along the ropes, and Fury just very simply and very smoothly, like he like as if he's not a man who is six nine. And 268 pounds proceeds to just make him miss five times in a row. 
before yep. ducking out and hitting him with an uppercut to the body. And he didn't look the least bit worried. Like, he was dodging those punches like he saw this in slow motion. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> and then, to get even more disrespectful, he starts putting both of his hands down. Like, he's literally walking forward with both hands, like, at his waist side. Like, complete, utter disrespect and disregard for anything Schwartz had. And um, I don't even remember the, the punch that now. I just remember his hands coming down to his waist, and he just started to kind of just beat on Swartz. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, he took him to school. That's that's pretty much what happened. I think uh, Swartz had a little bit of blood on, like, his nose. Um, they knocked him down once or twice. Uh, I want to say twice. But so yeah, I think he knocked him down twice. Before, I think the second one was when the ref stepped in. Like he, he should, they should just called the fight when he missed all those punches on the fence, uh, the ropes because it was just like, mm -hmm. yeah, like you obviously are not just meant to be here. I'm sorry, go right. home. Right. The, those, those were your best shots of the night, and you didn't land. <laughs> you didn't land any like of them. The, the back, the back. It's not even that he didn't land. He didn't even come close. He didn't even touch him. Mm -mm. Five shots. He's six eight. He's not. A small target, and you couldn't hit him once. And that's got to be, like, a confidence killer. Like, not only is this dude boxing my face up, but when I finally get my offense off, like, I can't land anything. <laughs> like, I can't. Yeah, he... It, I mean, it was one of those fights, and I'm not going to act like I don't really know Tom Schwartz, but I'm assuming that he's not people probably knew some... he's, not a, yeah. he's not a top 20 heavyweight. Yeah, this was a squash match. This was a showcase fight for Fury. Like, I'm going to just go out and kind of show you guys what I can do. This was and, a fight I mean, where he was guaranteed, like, I want to say he was guaranteed, like, $12 million for it by uh, ESPN. Mm, easy money. Easy money. <laughs> easy money. And, I mean, good on Fury. I'm glad he didn't drag this out for 12 rounds. Um, he got him out of there, man. He looked really good. Dude, this is why I keep saying he's the most skilled heavyweight. It's just that skills at heavyweight don't mean anything. A lot of the time, I should say. Like, yeah, it only take, it takes one punch to knock all that skill out the window. Right. Um, but now, if you, if you want to see a schoolage, I mean, and it's only two rounds, so you, you ain't going to be there for that long. Probably about what, six minutes. Right. Six, seven minutes. Go, uh, go give that fight a look. He, he, uh, he took Tom Schwartz to school and just kind of yeah. Dude, like... It, it, it was one of those. Yeah, like... Like... Dyson Fury is easily one of the best defensive heavyweights in boxing you've probably ever seen. Yeah. Man, it, he is very... It's such a shame he's not a little bit better of a person, but... It's crazy how just graceful he is, somebody who moved, who's, like, that big. This is a dude who, like, was most famous for the longest time for punching himself in the in the face in the middle of a fight. <laughs> oh, man. But, uh, yeah, he got sports out there via second-round TKO. Did you catch any of the, the undercard? Yes, I saw the uh, the Jesse Hart um, Sullivan Barrera fight. Was super surprised with how it went. But that, that um, I'm not going to call it a cheap shot. Though you probably could qualify as a cheap shot in the second round, seems you just take Sullivan Barrera just completely out of the fight. They tied up in this really awkward angle where, like, oh, excuse me, um, you want to make all right? Um, they tied up in this really awkward angle. Um, Barrera, Barrera had his one arm glazed over. Um, but he is basically just completely backwards and not facing uh, Hart. And Hart hits him with an uppercut with his arm that just happens to be underneath his, uh, Barrera's left arm. And, it, like, it seemed from that point on, he was really just concussed, uh, Barrera. And, but he, he battled through. It was a close fight on the cards, but, like, he never looked comfortable in that fight. It was a lot of grabbing, um, a lot of getting tagged clean and then trying to fire back, but just ending up in... Like in a tie up, um, but big win for Hart, like huge win. Um, this is a dude who was uh, down at like, sixty eight 
had lost to a Gilberto Ramirez. So it is a huge win for him. Um, I don't remember where Sergey Kovalev, uh, Kovalev ended up, but that's probably his next fight if he if uh, if he can get it with ESPN. And did you catch? Uh, oh, I got it pulled up in front of me. What's this? Michaela Meyer. Uh, and Liz- Elizabeth Crespo. No, ESPN Plus wouldn't let me open the damn card to catch the fight. So like, the first like fifteen twenty minutes of um, the the Fury card, like the from ten to like ten twenty, I was just sitting there with a blank screen, like wondering where the hell is the Michaela Mayer fight. And I go on Twitter and people are tweeting about it, and they're like, oh, it's in a different window. And I go try to open the different window, and then the top rank is just like, nope, f- the fight's over, or not not the fight's over. Uh, the fight's inex- un- uh, inaccessible at the moment. Please check back later. I was really upset about it. Right. So thanks, ESPN Plus. You dicks. <laughs> so we paid monthly subscription for this trash. But, uh, yeah. So that was uh, Tyson Fury schooling uh, Tom Schwartz. So that leads us all to... The uh, main crux of the episode, uh, Bellator 222, which went down at Madison Square Garden, uh, headlined by Roy McDonald and Neiman Gracie. Uh, on paper, this was a really awesome card, a lot of good matchups. And from what I saw, it was a pretty good card, man. I was pretty entertained, uh, but we will run this from the top. Uh, as I said earlier, headlined by Roy McDonald and Neiman Gracie, and this was the semifinal for the uh, welterweight uh, tournament that Bellator has been holding over this past year, or however long it's, <laughs> it's been going. But um, I'll, I'll say off off jump, even though Neiman Gracie lost, I was actually pretty impressed. Um, I think it was a fight that he, he definitely lost, but considering that I think this was like his 10th MMA fight, he was 9-0 coming in, I want to say. Something like that. E- either way, if you compare, yeah, if you compare experience between Gracie and McDonald, I mean, you, obviously we know like McDonald's literally probably had like double the fights that Neiman has had, and we all know, we know Roy's accomplishments. We know what he what he's done in this sport, so on and so forth. Um, I, I thought it was good on Gracie that he he didn't get like completely destroyed or you know, he had moments. He held his own. To to me, he did. So I wasn't impressed on that end. Like. There were a couple of moments where he actually was able to get Rory down. He was going for submissions. He tried tried a couple knee bars. Um, oh, see, it was some other submission I feel like he, he went for. But e- either way, he was going for submissions. He had a couple of moments where he was getting Rory in bad spots, but also good on Rory because every bad spot that he got put in, he was pretty much able to get out of. Um, it wasn't like a super... I'm trying to think of the word. This fight wasn't like a bloodbath because it was like a lot of grappling, a lot of battling for position, transitions. There weren't wasn't like a ton of striking going on, at least on the feet. Um, a lot of this did take place on the ground, but I I was impressed that Roy was able to get out of a lot of bad spots. Um, he dealt more of the damage. It, it seemed like by like the fifth round, Neiman was. He actually got a takedown early, but he wasn't able to do much, much with it. Um, but yeah, like Roy, in, in the in the bits it stood on the feet, I think we all knew who the better striker was. And Roy was more than able to hold his own on the ground. And actually, there were moments where he took Neiman down and initiated takedowns and got off some ground and pound. Um, like I said, Neiman just wasn't really able to get like a consistent offense. But he had moments where he was threatening, making it a competitive fight. Um, and good, good on Rory. For, I feel like in every Rory fight, he somehow gets his nose busted. Yeah. And, <laughs> I think his nose, it looked like it was intact after this. Um, he wasn't bleeding all over the place, so that was a good sign. So, Rory left this fight, you know, probably a little banged up, but, you know, not as bad as we've seen in probably like his past two to three, probably even more. Um, but no, it, it was a cool fight. I, I I like what Roy did. He he got out of a lot of bad spots. He he won his uh, retains his belt. 
th this is kind of the final I wanted because I want to see Lima. I, I want to see Lima be champ, and I want him to take it from Roy. So I, I got the fight I wanted. So I'm I'm happy. But props to Neiman though, man. Like a, a new face in Bellator and got all the way to the semifinals. Fell short to Rory, which is nothing to be ashamed of. Um, no, nah, cool, cool fight though. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I don't really have a lot to add. Um, it it, it felt kind of not like a return to form for Rory, but it felt more in line with like what we're used to seeing of Rory. Yeah, uh, it didn't get the, the pace wasn't too high. He was in control for most of the bout and. Um, when he got taken down, he kind of didn't have a lot to offer there in terms of just, like, being able to uh, put off his back. Uh, managed to get back to his feet, I guess. But, um, yeah, no, it was like a typical Rory performance, um, which, after the John Fish performance, was a little heartening, I guess, just because he, he really seemed like he didn't want to be there anymore. So. Yeah, he, he looked like he had a little more energy. There's a little more umph. Right. Umph, yeah. So, but yeah, it was a. Uh, it was weird though, cause did you see the video of the John Fitch in the back? Like, I think it was during like the weigh-ins, cause he was I don't know was he like an alternate or something? They they kept showing him. He was I saw videos of him. He was there. I don't know why. Um, Stug sent me a thing. Sent us a thing actually. Saying did you guys see that John Fitch was going to be at Masters where we were uh, maybe it was an alternate. Maybe Lima's hurt, and they were just, like, waiting to spring the fact that it's going to be John Fitch, Roy McDonald, too, for the uh, the, the Grand Prix Championship. Uh, we all right. Let me just put <laughs> yeah. that out there. Yeah, we, we all right. <laughs> but, um, nah, man, so at some point in the future, we'll have Roy McDonald versus Neiman, uh, not Neiman, versus, uh, Douglas Lima, and I'll be looking forward to it, man. Uh, and good to see that Roy is kind of returning to form in this fight, because you, you're going to need it against Lima. Def, definitely going to need it against Lima. Uh, so, cool main event. Congrats to Roy retaining his belt, and definitely looking forward to seeing Neiman Gracie. I think he's got a pretty good future if he can just keep on improving. Um, Co main event. Speaking of the 205ers, Leona Machida. Chell Sonnen. Um, hmm. Where, where do I even start with this? I mean, with the Chell fight, you you all you already know what Chell's gonna do. I don't think Chell's game plan ever changes. <laughs> it doesn't matter who he's fighting. It doesn't matter what style they have. It doesn't matter what their um attributes are, what they're good at, what they're terrible at. Chell's gonna rush in. He's going to close distance, he's going to shoot, and he's going to try to get you down. And it's pretty much what this was. Tried to shoot on Machida, but we all know Machida does actually have pretty good uh, takedown defense. They had some moments clinching against the cage. Uh, my, my only, and, and we, we've seen this with Chael, um, I think you kind of see this with wrestlers sometimes too, that they're, they're really devoted to the game plan, which I get, you know, push for it, take you down, beat you up, so on and so forth. But in being so devoted, I feel like... I'm trying to think of a way to describe this. Not only do they leave themselves open sometimes, but like there are just certain things that happen during the fight repeatedly that it's like, I don't know if you guys are just ignoring this or you just don't care, but if you keep letting him land this certain strike, it's going to come back to get you. Because a lot of what Machida landed was the same things over and over again. Like, he caught Chael with, like, the same body kick. <laughs> like, a, a good four to five times. And I get it, Chael's just trying to, like, I'm just push through this, whatever, whatever. But it's like, you can't just keep eating those. Because even in Machida's older age, you know, he might not be as fast um, as he used to be. But dude is still crafty, and he's still smart. He knows what you're trying to do. So he's going to capitalize if you keep kind of just giving him the same reads. So he lands a lot of good body kicks. And then in the first round, uh, Chael goes for a takedown. And Machida just flying knees the man's head off. Props to Chael for surviving. I thought he was going to be out. And Machida landed a lot of ground and pound. And, you know, props to Chael. He toughed it out and was able to get back to his feet. 
and then it was wild because in the second round, it's like he got caught with the exact same thing, like body kicks, gets caught with like the same knee, <laughs> and then eats more ground and pound. Except this time, he didn't get back up. And you know, impressive win from Machida. You land two flying knees in a fight. Um, a good, a good highlight reel finish for him. And uh, not not so good finish for Chell, but. With with Chael, I think with every Chael fight, like I said, you know what you're gonna get. We we know what the game plan is. Um, yes, he got caught. Mm -hmm. he got caught with a with, with a knee. Help stepping the like, you know, you're gonna make yourself vulnerable to that if you're shooting takedowns from like five feet out. And he was just like pathologically aggressive with it. He did not want to exchange with Leo and Machida at all. Um. Yeah, no, props to Machida. Um, like, they give him the right matchup. The dude can still, you know, do the karate thing and uh, just, like, give us, like, the spectacular knockout finishes that, you know, we've seen from him in the past. Like, he's not too far removed from um, face-kicking Vitor Belfort into oblivion. Feel me? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, this wasn't one of the fights I was interested in, to be honest with you. But I'm happy Machida got a win. He still, he, he's not fighting dudes like I, I say he's not fighting dudes like Gegard Musasi. But you know they're trying to make that rematch happen because Gegard yeah. wants it, and he's fighting next week, and the the timing's just too perfect. Um, but yeah, no, um, props to Machida pick up the win. He talked about in the uh, post fight conference thing that uh, he wanted to fight in Japan. Um, so, uh, before his career is over, so, you know, be on the lookout for Machida and Ryzen, I guess. Um, right. <laughs> I guess we could talk about Chael, um, deciding to hang it up. Chael's not one of those dudes, I believe, is looking to hang it up. So. You think we'll, you think we'll see him back in like three, four months? We'll, we'll see him when... When Chuck Odell finds a promoter depraved enough to give him a fight, no. we will see Chael Sonnen there. No. We, we can't put that in the atmosphere. Mm. <laughs> we can't put that in the atmosphere. But, uh, yeah, he, he did decide to hang it up. Um, I'll, I'll ask you something, because I, I saw this uh, uh, this morning on Twitter. That uh, had a couple of the people in the uproar. Did you see the the post fight uh, with him and uh, I think it was Brett Akamoto? No, what did you say? Okay, so it, it, it's, it's real uh, quick clips, like eighteen seconds. So if anybody knows uh, Chael Sonnen a little bit about his history, like he he's always had this thing of like he promised his dad um, before he died that he would become a champion, and you know thus far, unfortunately, that hasn't happened. He had a snag in WEC, which they mentioned during the broadcast. You guys can go back and do the history on that but the, up to this this point you know it, it hasn't happened and during the press uh post fight press conference uh brett asked him um he said uh just, just to paraphrase he's like i got one more question for you he said i'm you know sorry if this is kind of personal and tough but he was like you know i, I remember you saying um you know that you you know before you hung it up you promised your dad that you would be champ so on and so forth and I think he asked him, um, if you could talk to your dad right now, like, what would you tell him? And Chell, you know, obviously got, like, a little emotional, and he just said, I will just tell him, like, I tried. And a lot of people thought that was kind of, like, a dick question to ask. Um, where, where, where do you fall on that? And I guess it's kind of hard for you because you didn't really see the video. Right. I mean, but, you know. Maybe that's something you don't ask him immediately after a, after a tough a fight where he gets knocked out. Like, may, may you sit on that for a couple of days and you wait for, like, a follow-up interview where, like, you ask him about, like, what his life plans are and stuff like that afterwards. Mm. Give him some time. But, um, I mean, I'm not too, I'm not, I'm not going to fall too hard on him for asking that question. Yeah, I, I see both sides. I, I don't think he was trying to be a jerk, just, like, listening to, like, the tone of his voice. I don't think he was trying to, you know... I don't, I don't think there was any, like, malice at play, you know. Right. I, I, I don't believe that at all. Um, was it a bit, I, and I get it, you know, you're a journalist, you got to ask the tough questions. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. That I, I'm not gonna bash Brett because, like I said, I, I don't think he had bad intentions by doing it. Yeah, just maybe maybe the timing probably wasn't a. Uh, you know that that might be a, a question you save for you know th this fight is simmered down a little bit. Maybe we're like a couple weeks removed. You know, Chell pops up on like a random MMA show and does an interview. Maybe you save it for that. Um. But yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I, I I see both sides of it. I I don't think he he probably could have saved that. He m maybe not have had to. But I'm not gonna bash him because I I don't think he had like malicious intent. But anyway, um, yeah, Chell. You know, quote unquote retired. We'll we'll see how MMA. You know, MMA retirements are weird. We we never know how they uh <laughs> how they're gonna go if if it is indeed the the end. Uh, I mean, Chell, I, I would say all things considered, never, never, never was a champion, but had a pretty solid career. Um, fought a lot of great fighters, had some some pretty good wins. I'll re always remember him mauling Yushin Okami uh, back when Yushin was like a big deal. Um, I'm still always amazed when I look at Chell's record that he beat Shogun. Like that fight, just <laughs> uh, <laughs> that fight always sticks out to me. I mean, like, anybody willing to. Uh... So wrestle with Shogun has a good chance of just submitting him these days. Yeah, well, I, I guess at the time, like Shogun was still older, but I don't know. I, I thought Shogun was just gonna win that fight handily. I, in my mind, that's how I had it going. I did not. I didn't think Chelsea had a chance to win that fight, and boy, he ended up uh, choking him out. But no, nah, man. If, if it is over for Chell, you know. Good luck in the post-fight career. I mean, I'm pretty sure he'll be fine. The the, the way he is with the microphone, he'll, he'll have a job for a long time. We will. We'll, this this ain't the last of of chill what whatsoever. But uh, congrats to Machida. Another highlight, real finish. See see where he goes from here. Uh, moving on down at catchweight, <laughs> Dylan Danis uh, versus Max Humphrey. No comment. Um. No comment. Yeah, Dana's came. Yeah, like, <laughs> this, this was a, a go nowhere. Like, no, nah, I shouldn't say. This fight should have been on the prelims because, like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't care about Dylan Dana's fighting some dude who's like three and two. Yeah, this definitely should have been a. Yeah, this should have been a prelim. I thought they were honestly going to put both Rising fighters on the, on the co-headliner, or I'm not on the main card, or maybe even the Pico fight, but. Maybe they were being cautious with Pico. Well, we'll, we'll get to him <laughs> in, a, in a little bit. But, yeah, not not a lot to talk about in this fight. Dylan Danis came out in his leopard print shorts, uh, took Humphreys down, landed a lot of solid uh, ground and pound, got Humphreys to open up, uh, went for, like, a rear naked choke a couple times, ended up not getting it, and then he ended up getting an arm bar, um, did a nice little flip over with the arm bar to make it belly down, and submitted Humphrey. Uh, that was it. Um, yeah, we'll just move yeah. on. <laughs> not, not, not a lot to really dig in with that fight. Yeah. Um, this next fight, I have some questions. Yeah. Patrick Mix versus uh, Ricky Bandejas. So, I think we all knew. I can't remember what promotion Ricky was in prior, but. We know he came over to Bellator. He uh he gave <laughs> he gave came he gave James Gallagher the uh, Shawn Michaels super kick. Um, so he's been doing this thing in Bellator. Comes over to fight. Uh, it comes over. Patrick Mix comes up. This is his debut. Not sure what organization he was before this, but for what I've been hearing, he was a, a heavily touted prospect. King of the cage, man. Yeah. So my first thought before we even get into this fight, um. The whole prospect against prospect thing. Like, I get it on paper, it's a good fight. But this, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, this could be one of those things where because Bellator doesn't have as much depth as, you know, like the UFC, maybe they're forced to make these kind of fights. I thought it was weird to have two prospects that I think you're hoping turn into something and you're matching them up really early. Um, On one hand, I think... There may be something to it, but on the other hand, like I'm looking at the belt, like the Bellator's bandweight division is like four fighters in it, 
that are actually like not prospects anymore. And it's like I'm not sure if Joe Warren's even fighting anymore. Nothing. Yeah, I think he's out. So you got him, you got Dantes, you got Caldwell, and like and you got like Juan Archuleta, who just fought that featherweight on the same card earlier in the night. Like so um like they 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 their their bandweight division for the longest time has been just just bare bones. So I get like okay, we got this Patrick Mix kid. Let's see if he's the real deal and throw him in there with I don't know, um Ricky Mendejas, like somebody who we have no plans for. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I don't, yeah. I'm not gonna say they didn't I, I I'm not gonna say they have a grudge against him knocking out um James Gallagher. Gallagher, but like at the same time, like they are, they, I don't think they're like super high on um, Mendes. It's not exactly like they come to his neck of the woods to put on cards a lot. So, um, like I, I, I get the logic behind making the fight. It's just like who, who else are you gonna match him up with? That's interesting, I guess. Like, is Sean Bunch still a, a, a fighter? Or is he just like a full time AKA wrestling guy now? Oh, I can't remember the last time I've heard his name. Yeah, I just checked and he said he last fought in like February. So I, mean, I don't know. So, like, yeah, yeah this is, I think this just comes down to belts, which is not having a, a whole bunch of names in that division for guys to fight. <clears throat> I mean, that makes sense. And, and I guess th- this, you know. On, on paper, this is like a pretty stacked card for Bellator. So I guess you need names. So, you know. You got you got to throw fights in. That'll get people excited. Get people talking. Um, as for the performance, though. Uh, boy, did Mix make some quick work of Bandejas. Um, that back take was really slick to me. Oh, yeah. Like, absolutely. Like... <laughs> that, that back take was so slick. Like, they clinched. And he kind of... I can't really describe what he did. He kind of, like... Trying to think of how to put this into words. He, it's not shoved. Shoved is not the word I'm looking. He like nudged Bandejas really hard to kind of like make his shoulder, upper body like turn over. I'm probably describing this terribly, but <laughs> like it was the way he got, the way he got Bandejas to kind of turn around while they were clinched so he could just jump on his back. And it, to me, when I saw him do that, I was like, this looks like something he does a lot. Yeah. Like, I, I don't think this was like, oh, I just got an opportunity. This looked like he planned to do this, and it, it worked. Like, but, if you guys just, just watch the fight. It only lasted a minute. It's not, not much to watch. But Thailand just scored um, on Sweden, and their coach is crying. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Mind you, they're down 4-1, to one, but I think this might be the first time they ever scored, uh, scored in a, uh, a World Cup, so... Hey, go Thailand. I'm off I'm off for moral victories. <laughs> but um uh yeah, World Cup is going on right oh, now. Yeah, yeah, I gotta run in the background. The reason you, now you haven't heard me say much about it is because uh it's not been pretty. Hmm. At least not for Thailand, uh, so um yeah, no, like just any time you can take a man's back in the middle of the cage like, not even along the cage where, like, you might be able to corner him, but just hop onto his back. It, like, that that's insta-style points. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and Charles yeah. Pat, like, came in here and submitted Bandera. So, if he had two more rounds, I think he probably would have beat Archuleta. And we see, we've see we seen how good Archuleta is. So, he comes in and immediately makes a name for himself. Yep. Those, those king of the cage yeah. dudes, man. Like, they... they for whatever reason, they don't cut it. They don't get signed to the UFC. Like, Warren Hill is a dude who's was got to like twenty and zero before the UFC even gave him a call, or twenty uh, not the UFC Bellator, but before Bellator was able to get him away from there. Like Jimmy Rivera is another dude who was like on a nineteen fight winning streak and was like a king of the cage champion, and it took forever for the UFC to call his number. I I don't know if it has something to do with the contracts. I don't know if it has something to do with just, like, them not putting a lot of stock into the king of the cage, uh, you know, brand, which I understand because apparently it's a brand they just lease out to whoever, whatever rinky-dick promoter wants to borrow it. But, uh, 
They've been turning out some quality fighters. Um, there you go. Yeah, he took this back real quick. Got that choke in, and you know, we'll, we'll see what he turns into at bantamweight. I mean, they need like that, they just need bantamweights to fill that division, man. Like, that's what it comes down to. Um, yeah. like they signed Manny Vasquez. Um. And, Vin, uh, and Vinicius Zani, who I want to say for in the UFC. Like, he was like a tough guy. I could be wrong. I could be confusing him with somebody else. Yeah, I'm confusing with somebody else. Um, I'm confusing with the other Vinicius, the, like the middleweight or welterweight or whatever. Um, but like they, they just need dudes to fill up that division. And Mix is just, they, they like into like a really solid uh, fight. Like, there you go. Patrick Mix. First round submission over Ricky Bandejas. We'll see uh, how he does at Bantamweight. Uh, moving on to Featherweight. Uh, well, I think the somebody said this fight took place at Featherweight because the turnaround time was so yeah. quick. Um, but, anywho, Juan Archuleta uh, squared off against former Bantamweight champ Eduardo Dantes. Um, boy. <laughs> um... <laughs> Yeah, Eduardo, uh, the Dantes was never able to um, really get off much of anything because Archuleta just a lot of footwork, a lot of like side to side motion, and then he would like periodically kind of like blitz in with a combination and catch Dantes with something. Um, he was mixing it up with his wrestling, uh, clinched Dantes against the cage a couple times. This Dantes could never really get comfortable because Archuleta was just always moving. Like, he was just always moving around, doing something. And then when they did exchange, like, Archuleta would blitz and he would catch Dantes. I want to say he clipped him uh, or stunned him at least once or twice. Um, yeah, like, we've seen Dantes be able to knock guys out, have really good striking performances, but... Been a while, but yeah. Yeah, been a while and he could not... He could not deal with that footwork, man. That footwork really. Yeah, like he 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 really struck. Like he had he had, this, he had a lot of the same problems Henry Burrell had, where he was just like, he he needs the opponent to engage with him on his terms at the end of his range, and like Archuleta was just like, no, I'm just gonna keep moving, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. So you're gonna be chasing me around the cage, and you're not very good at cutting me off. So like, what's the problem? And then like when he fi- like when he finally quote-unquote corners Archuleta he throws um was it the 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 switch kick yeah it was a kick and he was trying to follow it with like a one-two and uh, and yeah Archuleta just unbombed uh bombs him with like an overhand right at as like I think his leg is still in the air from the kick yeah it was it was a pretty crazy like finish sequence because he <laughs> he, he like checked the kick, but he like jump check. He, his, his his leg was really yeah, no, high. It was like there. he checked the body kick or something. Yeah, like he checked the kick, and I, I think he knew the one two was coming, and he just immediately just ducked, and Dantes missed the one two, and Archuleta came back with a right and just floored him. And keep in mind, one second left in the round. Because, like, they, they had sounded off the bell, like, right when, I think, Ed Dante started throwing the kick. Like, that round was almost over. Right. <laughs> Albeit Dante was, you know, he was losing the fight anyway. But, yeah, he got absolutely floored right at the end of the round. Um, great win for Archuleta, who is... Is he undefeated? He's still undefeated, right? Archuleta, he is, like, 20-1. and one. He lost like his first professional fight. I mean, I I I'll, I'll have to think he's got a he's got to be next for uh, Kyoji Horiguchi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, and he yelled his name after the fight <laughs> when he was celebrating on top of the cage. So um, yeah, you you got to think that's next. And hey, man, the man's earned it. He's been out here winning fights. Uh, he's been showing improvement, and. Especially, it's all about the highlight real KOs, man. Especially when you're trying to make a case for a title shot. Like, and he's got a couple of them in uh, Be- uh, Bellas right now. He knocked out Dantes, and he, no- he knocked out Peralta. Yep. And 
boy on the other end for Dantes, man, he is one. Yeah, one in. Yeah, his last four fights have not gone well. He's one in three, and his last four lost to Archuleta. Uh, his comeback, uh, coming off an of injury, he had beat Toby Masech, but before that, obviously the KO from McDonald, and then the loss to Caldwell, which was the fight that he uh lost his belt to. So I don't know. He he's kind of been like a little a little rough patch. But Archuleta, man, he he's on the come up, and he look he looks pretty good. I'm all for Archuleta Horiguchi. There will be a lot of movement in that fight. Cause Horiguchi does a lot of bouncing around, too. So <laughs> that'll be an interesting fight to see play out. But no, nah, shout out to Archuleta, man. That's that was a really good performance. Yep. Um, oh boy, this next fight. And at least the uh, the result was great. The actual fight itself, yeah. uh, not so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Now, now I, I can't fault them for making this the first. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, can we start off with, if Ben Askren says that your wrestling is boring and that you don't deserve the win for your takedowns, it's a problem. you have some serious problems with your approach. <laughs> um so, um, Kyojo Horiguchi, Darian Caldwell, number two, running back from, uh, what, was it last, this year, uh, this previous NYE event from Ryzen, where yeah. Horiguchi, uh, submitted Caldwell in the third round by a guillotine, um, and we all thought with the addition of the cage, Caldwell would, or not all of us, but there was a, a strong sentiment out there that with the addition of the cage, Caldwell would have the advantage, he'd be able to push Horiguchi into it. Be a lot harder for Horiguchi to get a guillotine along the cage. Um, it'd be easier for uh, Caldwell to uh, secure a position, and a lot of that turns out to be true. It also turns out that um, in the state of New York, who I think follows the new rules of uh, the new unified rules, even though they're not unified anymore. Um, if you don't do anything from the top, they're just not going to give you the round. Because uh, Horiguchi outstruck Darian Caldwell something like two hundred to one in this fight. <laughs> Off his back, and I'm not mad. I actually, that's the sentiment I agree with. Like, I get it. Like, if you land a takedown, it's a dominant position. But if you're not doing anything with it, and the other guy is at least like trying something, I believe he should get the round. Yeah. So I, I have no problem with this. Yeah. Um. Friggin' like the the few times they were on the feet, Horiguchi did well. Not like. He, he wasn't out there like super tagging Caldwell, but uh, this fight was literally what with one with Horiguchi on his back for like four rounds, and it was pretty hilarious. Aggravating in real time, but hilarious in hindsight. Yeah, like he, he literally won the fight just by landing pitter pat shots on the ground. The, the, like those annoying punches you throw when somebody's like, all right, get off. Right, the the, the like, funniest <laughs> part is how effective they were because, like, Caldwell's face was red by like the fourth round, solely from all the strikes that Horiguchi was throwing <laughs> from his butt. And it's just like I don't, I, I didn't hear Caldwell's corner advice, but you gotta think by like round three, they're like, all right, man, like your takedowns are great, cool, you're getting them down every round, that's great, but like you gotta do something, like. Because when we say Caldwell did nothing, like, like that's almost he literal. won one like, round because at the in the last minute he decided to like posture up and start throwing ground and pound, and it was real. It was good ground and pound, and he deserved to win the round for, off of that. But um, yeah, no, he like you said, he did nothing, nothing with the takedowns. Uh, I'm kind of surprised the ref let it go on that long. Oh my god, I. Ah. <laughs> that referee don't remember his name that guy was killing my soul because he would let Caldwell literally lay I, you talk about lay and pray this was lay and pray this is what lay and pray looks like he would let Caldwell lay and pray for like a good three minutes before he finally decided to stand them up and it's like dude like I, I get it like the first round the fight still you, you feeling everything out but like round three you know what Caldwell's doing at this point, Russ. Clearly, he's not. He ain't posturing up much. He ain't landing ground and pound. He's not really advancing and going for any submissions or anything. 
He's just sitting there. You can stand him up. No, nobody's gonna be mad at you. Nobody's gonna boo you. And like I said, when when Ben Askren is complaining, that's that that's an issue. I, you know, what I will say, Carswell did not get like takedowns like in the back half of the fight. His takedown seems to just happen because Horiguchi would just like recklessly close distance, and he would <laughs> and Carswell would like fold and just like go to his knees. And it wasn't like he was trying to shoot. He just ended up like, okay, I'm being overwhelmed right now. And I fell down, so I'm going to just shoot from here. It was, right. really, it was really awkward. <laughs> it was just like, yeah, if Horiguchi just stayed out just a little bit more when he tries to close distance, he probably would have just kept on the feet. But I guess it didn't matter. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it was... Uh... Yeah, we, we, we complained at first that this fight should not have started off the card because it was a championship fight and it's a five-rounder. But I'm glad, uh, in hindsight, Bellator, I'll take it back. You guys got it right. I'm glad we got this out the way. Um, but even still, with the fight being what it was and uh, Horiguchi won via unanimous decision, he is now the Bantamweight and Rising Champ at the same time. Albeit the fight wasn't exciting, but I'm really excited just of the result because Horiguchi just keeps winning. And how dope is it that I'm a champ in two different organizations at the same time? Like, Dude, like, it's, it, uh, uh, it, after the past couple of weeks, people really need to put some respect on Flyweight's name and on DJ's name. Because, like, it, 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 it his resume is just only looking better and better in hindsight. All right. Yeah, a lot of the guys he's beaten have went on to do some pretty, uh, pretty incredible things. Um, having two belts in two different organizations—that's the most baller. Like, because <laughs> it's not like, oh, I was the champ and rising, but then I left and came over here and got a belt. It's like, oh no, I'm still over there. Like, I run both neighborhoods now. Like, <laughs> I'm the king on both blocks. Um, what does he do next? Because I think they said that he has to defend at least once a year. Mm, Archuleta. I want, I want, yeah, so I guess in, in Bella to Archuleta fight. Like, I don't know. I, I don't know what Ryzen had planned for him. And, um, like, the, 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 a lot of the... Well, part of the reason I think they did this is because they just ran out of fights for him to do in, like, Ryzen. But, it, I mean, hold up. Let me check something real quick. Let's, I was going to check and see what uh, list of current UFC fighters. Let's see what featherweight, the flyweights, I'm sorry, have been cut recently. And uh, division, bantamweight, 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 featherweight. Like oh, yeah, every week, women's flyweight. I don't got anything on flyweight. Kind of like Dustin Ortiz is still out there, I guess, right? And I don't I ever heard of him finding like a permanent home. A uh, friend of the show, Jose Jordi, uh, Shorty Torres, maybe. Maybe you got him. Um, well, I don't think Moreno's gonna fight at. I mean, he probably would take that fight because you know, it's for a belt. But uh, Mateus Nicolau is a free agent. Um, but let me just pull up the best current best MMA flyweight fighters. Let's see, Pantoja, Formiga, Benavides, still all in the UFC. And Figueredo. Um Ortiz is a free agent. Wilson Hayes is free. Uh, I think John Moraga is a free agent. Don't don't quote me on that, but I think he's a free agent. I, I, I don't, he's a fought for a while, um, so it's hard to tell. Um, Brandon Moreno is an LFA. He just won the LFA flyweight title off of Michael uh, Perez, so you know that's a fight they could do if if uh, Sakaki Barra was willing. Uh, an Ali Bags rematch. Um. Kaikar Frank is in the UFC. Jordan Espinosa is in the UFC. I just wish there was some way we could finesse and get this DJ rematch. Hey, DJ seems pretty against it. Uh, come on, DJ. 
play ball, DJ. I mean, I, I don't know how that would work. One one championship hasn't been getting in on this whole cross promotion uh phenomenon. No, they yeah. They seem pretty. I'm not gonna say hell bent, but they they they, they feel, it feels like they are trying their best to be on the UFC's like side. But I don't send, I don't see them working with like Bellator or anybody Bellator works with, so that include Ryzen. Yeah, they're trying to build their own. Uh, I mean, I ain't mad. They're they're building their own little, little empire over there. So, but um, no, I mean, if you're a Gucci, you're you're in a good spot. You got two belts. Um, no, no you know, I, I I would hope you know whatever whichever organization that at least you know to the best of their ability with what's available out there, gonna try to get you some fun, entertaining fights. Um. See, I don't know. Yeah, the, as as far as rising there, the the pickings are a little different because you're gonna you you're probably just gonna have to find a lot of people just in a free agent pool, like who just isn't signed right now that we can bring over, who might be halfway entertaining that we can kind of throw at Horiguchi and you know hopefully it turns into a fun fight. We should bring back Ian Loveland so they can run back that rematch. I'd be down for that. I don't know. We'll. We'll, we'll we'll see we'll see. I wouldn't be mad at the Moreno fight. I, I would you know that would be fun. Um, I don't know. We'll, we'll we'll see we'll see what they do. But great on Horiguchi, man. The man just we say this every time he fights. Post UFC career, amazing. <laughs> you got two belts and two organizations at the same time. That is that's 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 goat tendencies. That is you know the man's winning that life, and I'm I'm all for it. So, congrats to Kyoji Horiguchi, man. Bellator Bantamweight oh, we should, camp. Oh, you should mention, he called out. He didn't call out, but he said he would love to fight Henry Cejudo. Yeah, I saw that, but I'm. What, what's the odds of that, really? I think zero. I would love to see it. Zero. Yeah, yeah, but that's not going to happen. Would never happen. I would love to see it happen, but... Yeah. Uh, hypothetically, who who would you take in that fight? Uh, I, I I find it hard to pick against Zahudo's pressure, just ability to just not feel pain when he's fighting. Yeah, I I would be rooting for Gooch with all my heart and soul, but uh, uh it's, it's getting really hard to doubt Zahudo. <laughs> <It's, laughs> after that last fight, it's getting. It's getting hard to doubt the man. He's he's been out here, but we'll we'll see what happens with Horiguchi. But either way, man, that was you know not not a great fight, but he got him a belt. You know, it is what it is. So congrats to Horiguchi. Uh, that rounds out the main card. Um, we're gonna read some of the results of the prelims, but we're not gonna spend too much time on every fight. But there are a couple of these I would like to talk about. Um, but just to run through a couple. Uh, Brandon Polcare defeated Brandon Medina via submission. Uh, Castriot Jima, I don't know if I'm saying that right, defeated Whitney Francois via TKO. Uh, John Benduce defeated Kenny Rivera via unanimous decision. Uh, spent a little bit of time on these next. You know what? I'm going to save Pico for less. Um, Taylor Turner, Heather Hardy. Any Any thoughts? On this fight, um, Heather Hardy is too old to be doing a, getting into MMA, and she was, she's just not the athlete she needs to be to make the transition. Like I hate saying that because I love watching her fight, at least in boxing. And it sucks that the boxing market is so monopolized, especially in Brooklyn by PVC, where that she can't freaking get a fight at the Barclays, and it's just she's not getting them. Like, she's an actual ticket seller in New York, but she can't going to allow her to be able to make money on fighting for a world title, and that's just insane to me. Um, but, like, her, her, even boxing, like, her, her, um, strengths lie in her ability, like, her durability, and the, like, her ability to keep a really, like, strong pace and, like, keep coming forward. And that's not stuff that really transfers over in MMA because you can get taken down and you can get kicked and 
we've seen against Williams, and we see we saw it here against Taylor. Um, just taking down like, and that, Taylor wasn't even throwing like hard ground and pound. It was like pitter patter stuff, and Hardy just had no answer to how to get her off of her. I was gonna say it, it was it wasn't the hardest, but it added up. Right. Because <laughs> it was a pretty high volume, and yeah, Hardy kind of just got taken down and got beat up. Um, yeah, not not a lot to analyze, but do 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 we do we think the whole Bellator thing is over? I I think Hardy's just gonna show up for a paycheck. Like, like if Bellator is gonna be in New York, they need they're gonna want somebody who can sell tickets and has already sell tickets. Yeah. Um. All right, we well, you know what? I'm not I'm not going to waste time on some of these. I'll, I'll just name the fight that some people might have been interested in and then uh we'll come back to pico and we'll come back to lareda um and we'll talk about reina a little bit but uh some of these other fights maybe some of you are interested in uh hobson gracie jr defeated oscar vera via submission uh i guess you could call him bantamweight prospect mike kimball defeated uh sebastian ruiz um you have any quick thoughts on kimball any any thoughts like a prospect or he is drawn like a Joseph Loeb comic book from the 90s. <laughs> like, get this man some water because he looks dehydrated as shit. <laughs> that's, that's the Mike Kimball breakdown. But he's built like Phil Davis, but like at 135 and short. <laughs> Yeah, he he looks like somebody that would be worth keeping an eye on. I'm not in in a rush to rush the man to the top anytime soon. But I mean, he just fought to a split decision with a guy who was two and two. Yeah. So yeah. I I think there are some tools there. there there's something there to be worked with. I can't. Remember. You know, uh, I want to say, uh, what was the gym he was training? At? Team Thunder MMA. You know it's a real. You know it's a good team when they have their phone number and their website and their uh, team banner like at the same size as the name of their uh, <laughs> their gym. But uh, he, I think he's the only like pro out of his gym, so that that could be hampering his uh, improvement. I mean, he looked he looked fine here. Like for I, I'm yeah you know, I, I I made fun of Ruiz's record, but like he's a tough dude. Um, if, like, especially early, if somebody, like, with his experience had eaten the shots he had eaten, they probably would have folded. Um, and Kimball would have got, like, a first or second round stoppage. But he, he hung in there and he battled through. Um, yeah, like, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a lot to to say about this fight as a whole. Like, like you said, Kimball's a great athlete. Um, maybe somebody to keep an eye on, but, like, we're, we're talking years of development here, and yeah. it, it kind of feels like Bellator is coming out of that, uh, like, it, it seems like there's, like, a number cap in Bellator where, like, you get a certain amount of fights, you just have to fight somebody um, who is not a Sebastian Ruiz, and I'm not sure what that number is going to be for Kimball, because they, they seem like they're pushing them. Like, no, nah, but like, how many other belts are prelim dudes get um, a post-fight press conference and like scrum thing? Right. Um. So, but, I, 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 I could see him getting to like five and one or six and one, and then them just throwing him in there with like uh, well, I don't even know like a Patrick Mix, uh, Ricky yeah, Benjaz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll go five and one and get. A name, just somebody that's recognizable in the Bellator brand, and they'll just see where he's at and what he can do. But yeah, like you said, though, if he if he's gonna move up this roster, he's definitely probably gonna need to go to a a bigger gym, or just at least be able to bring in some other like professional training partners, things like that, depending on where he's at. But um, just somebody solid, solid performance though, just somebody to possibly keep an eye on. Um, Phil Hawes defeated Michael Wilcox via TKO, uh, Dr. Stoppage. Uh, Marcus Seren defeated Necruz. Merkel Jayev 
defeat uh, via unanimous decision. And Haim goes out, defeated Gustavo, World of Terror via submission. So we're going to rewind and go back to three fights that we can kind of talk about just for a little bit. Uh, just some quick thoughts on. Uh, Lindsey Van Zandt versus uh, Reyna Kubota. So uh, Reyna was the other rising fighter on this card. Um, I wasn't really too familiar with Lindsey Van Zandt. Uh, former uh, Invicta fighter. Hmm. Uh. So, uh, I think we noted once that Lindsey Van Zandt was, like, the only atom weight we had ever seen in um, in Bellator before. And now we know why, because they, they needed an atom weight to fight Rana um, when she came over. Um, I think Rana's tweet after the, after the whole fight uh, best summed up just did the whole experience of watching her lose. And it was something like along the lines of, um, I just don't have the aptitude for MMA. Which just seems more and more true um, with every fight he gets against anybody who can grapple even a little bit. Yeah. She got. It's like when it goes to the ground, there's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of resistance, not a lot of, uh, options. Yeah, yeah. Um, props to Lindsey Van Zandt. That's a bit, that's a nice name to have on your resume. Um, yeah. Like I, I don't know if Bellator plans on making an atom weight division. It might help them fill up some more cards, to be honest, with some more interesting ballots. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like. Rena was somebody, if they were going to bring over, she would have been good for, like, a Bellator kickboxing card. We have her fight, um... Well, none of the women they have in Bellator kickboxing are small enough for Rena, but we just, like, have her fight, like, some local jobber or something. Alright. Or Carrie Melendez. Where's she been? Did she fight this year? Uh, yeah, yeah. She had fought this year. Yeah, she did. I can't remember who she fought, but she fought recently. Yes. Yeah, it kind of sucks for some of the women in the smaller weight classes because it's, you know, you have good fighters down there, but, like, depending on what organization you're in, just the ability to just even be able to find fights can be kind of few far in between. Yeah. I mean... And it's not Rana's like, fighting in Japan. Like, there is no shortage of like weekend warriors well, yeah, she, yeah. she could probably crush. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure, she'll sure be fine. But if you're like here in the U.S., you're like an Invicta, or you are just like shit out of luck. Yeah, and it's not like even if you know you're Invicta, you know, you're not making necessarily life changing money. Right. It's you know that's a hard that's a hard grind to to go through. But um, no, nah, good. That's a great win for Lindsay, though. Like you said, that's a good name to have on your resume, a recognizable name. Um, hopefully, it does something good for her. I I don't know where she'll go next. Like I said, we don't even know what Bellator is really doing <laughs> with this division. I mean, and this fight was at catchweight too. I think. Oh uh, well, on the wiki page it says it was at catchweight. Yeah, it was at well, it's at one twelve, which is a which is the weight class that uh, Rena fights in in Japan. Oh, okay. Okay. So I don't know if that was on so, purpose or if one of them came in like seven pounds or weight or or whatever. Yeah, but we'll we'll see. Great great win for Van Zant though. Pretty dominant one sided win. Um, so we'll we'll see what they do with her next and with with that division if if they decide to move forward. Uh, moving on to flyweight, uh, Valerie Lareda versus uh, Larkin Dash. Uh, Lareda. The Taekwondo ace. I can't remember the last time she fought, but it was this year. Um, this is her second pro fight. Uh, Larkin Dash, who made headlines because uh, she is an MMA fighter, but she got a lot of headlines for working at Hooters. So they kind of labeled, labeled blah, blah. <laughs> they labeled her. Uh, you know, the Raiders just fighting a random Hooters chick. That was kind of the. Uh, there you go. Not say headline. Yeah, I think but, I, I think I made that joke last week too, and. I, my my old thing was not so much that she worked at Hooters, but that she is a bad fighter. 
Uh, she's tough as yeah, shit. This... Like, don't get me wrong. She took a she she took a lot in this fight, but like, maybe like one is a super athletic, like, experienced combat sports expert, and the other one's like a twenty two year old who was like four and four as an amateur or three and four as an amateur or something like that. It had lost her only pro fight. The, this <laughs> this was an interesting fight to say the least. Um, yeah, you, you could tell just by looking at like not not even I didn't say body language, but just like movement of who's been fighting for a while, even if it's not an MMA. Like who just has a lot of fighting experience in general. One of these women has at a combat time. sports background; the other does not. And the right, yeah, yeah. You could tell just kind of by the way Dash was moving her, uh, I don't know if you want to call it boxing stance. I'm not really sure what you call it, but <laughs> it looked kind of awkward, to say the least. But like I said, if nothing else, what Dash has going for her, she definitely has heart and toughness. Because she ate a lot of shots um, that I think a lot of other people either would have gotten put out by or at least would have maybe gotten stumbled or sent the back or you know something like that yeah but, she almost she man she almost managed to turn some of those into takedowns like there was um a sequence in the first round where like she just caught one of um Valerita's punches and just tried to drag her to the ground with her arm <laughs> it was like a big sister throw she was trying to do right and it's just like, like like get over here you're not the big sister here <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I I applaud Dash's like grit, toughness, and like just grit and like scrappiness. Like it didn't look pretty, but I like the effort, man. Yeah. Cause she was go, she was she she was clearly like outmatched in like terms of just technique, but she was going for it. <laughs> like she's out here swinging kind of these wild punches. She has kind of this really awkward, like moving motion. But that did not stop her from constantly moving forward, and she was going for it, and I respect that. I, I respect that a lot. She, because she ate a lot of body kicks. I think at one point she ate a head kick that she just took like a chance. Oh yeah, no, like, like like I said, this fight is nothing but, if not a testament to fucking how tough Larkin Dash is, and how athletically gifted Loretta is. Like, good god, like if she learns to fight, fight, like like how. Like how Alex Alex uh, Henderson, after he lost to Don Cerrone, was like, "I have to learn to fight." If she learns to fight, like in that context, she's gonna be really good. Yeah, like she's got tools, and she's at a great gym. So like, you you hope it comes. Um, and I think this fight will be good for her just because it like she needs women who will give her rounds. And yeah, you need the the ring time. Yeah. And didn't give her, um, you know, it wasn't, didn't pose too much of a threat, right. but, like, wouldn't give her, it wasn't a blow-through. Like, you're not just going to come in here and just... Yeah, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to put you in there, like, you're Tiffany Van Zeus, and I'm going to put you in there with a 1-0 and woman who just so happens to be a collegiate wrestler. They gave her somebody right. who was going to be tough to put away. Maybe they didn't know that, but, you know, hindsight, 2020. Um, so, you know... It, it, it's good for your prospects. You just, I, I, I just wonder. Hopefully, that Bellator can build her up properly for Lareda, because obviously she's not ready for. You know, mm. she's still really, really green. That's that's and one of the don't... benefits of being in this division, though. Is just that everybody's green. Right. I don't know, matter of fact, I can't even call it like. Um... Just the benefit. It could it it could end up with her getting a title shot after like two or three more wins, just because they need somebody to fight Lima and McFarland. I hope that's not the case, but you never know. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I I want to see her get thrown up there too quick, but it is one of those things. Like when you're in a division that's kind of thin. I ain't gonna say winning is a bad thing, but it's like when you keep winning, it's just kind of like at some point we have no choice but to kind of. Like, you're the only one who's kind of standing out, so mm. kind of just got to see what you got. But, nah, Lareda definitely has a lot of tools that can work. Um, mm. And I, I'll, I'll say this for Dash. I'll, I'll go out on a limb by myself. I, I don't know how old she is. I feel like they were both pretty young. Oh, yeah, no, Dash is 22. 
Like, I feel like for Dash, because that kind of, like, grit and toughness, like, you can't, that's not something that's, like, teachable. Like, you either kind of have that or you don't. Right. Um, and I think that's a good trait to have. If she can just kind of fine-tune everything <laughs> else, I'm not saying she's going to be champ. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying you could just be somebody we can bring in just to have some fun fights. Right. Like, and there's a market you, for that. Yeah. You you can be one of those fighters, and there's you'll you'll always have as long as you can be somewhat consistent. <laughs> you'll you'll always have a job. They they can always throw you in on the car like yeah we just we just need somebody to bring some blood. You you can be there's, one of those. There's always room for like a Jan Finney type. All right. So. Um, yeah, I, I, but props to Loretta. I know, I was going to say, I don't think I'm going to nowhere because this is about to start thunderstorming. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. I think I'm mad at the call my day. <laughs> I got caught. Do a quick, quick, just random side tangent. Um, so I went to see my dad on, what day was that? Uh, I think it was Friday after work. And I knew it was going to storm, but I was like, you know what, I can get there storms and about the first 15 minutes I was good sun was out everything was great I get off on the exit to get on the highway torrential downpour like to the point where I had like <laughs> my windshield wiper speed on max and I still couldn't see yeah no, what no, was going that, that on that's terrifying you ever had your your wind your windshield wiper just like fall the fuck off your car in the middle of the rainstorm I, I hope not. I hope it never. Yeah, that is, I'm that pulling over. Is terrifying. <laughs> yeah, like the only thing that was allowing me to see was like tail lights from other cars. Like, all right, I can tell I'm still going in a straight line, depending on other people. You have to trust <laughs> that they're going in a straight line. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like either we're all, you know, one of us is gonna die. We're all down together. So I'm depending on you guys to keep me, keep me alive. But now, yeah, that that torrential downpour rain. It's that's no no bueno no bueno and luckily like it was kind of stop and go traffic so i wasn't going too fast so i think that kind of helped too but yeah that that torrential rain man it's not not to be played with but uh, uh congrats to valerie Lareda. we'll see how they continue to build her up but definitely she's got a lot of tools to work with uh last fight that we will mention adam borix versus aaron P. yeah Let's uh let's let's talk about this for a little um, bit. <laughs> so let's start let's start with the actual fight, and then we can go into the um the ass hattery that is Bellator prospect matchmaking. Um, so Aaron Pico uh, recently switched camps. Uh, I think well, who was he with before? Was it um? Shoot, I know this. Was it AJ McKee's dad, Antonio McKee? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, he was with those guys over at um whatever their gym is called. Like so it's them, it's like it's AJ McKee, it's um uh crap, what's his name? Uh Kimbo Slice Jr., Baby Slice, um and, and a bunch of those other dudes who you see hanging around Bell's work cards. Um he recently switched over to uh, Mike Winks or Jackson Winks, um but I guess you can call him Mike Winkle John's gym now because I don't think Greg Jackson's actually a coach there anymore. Um, and they, they switched up his style. He, he he relies more on his wrestling now, and we saw it here for the first time. I think it's the first time we ever seen him shoot for a takedown. Yeah, so it's like repeatedly. Yeah. Like he, like was, he was he was all dogged, in. Um, chasing after those takedowns. I'm gonna say he 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 dominated the first round in the way that you dominate the first round where you wrestle the other guy and uh, he doesn't throw anything back and you don't really throw anything but like you keep getting the takedown so you know judges have to give the round to somebody. All right. The second round, he, he uh, shoots for a takedown. Borix gets up. Um, Borix proceeds to start walking uh, Pico down. Pico, either tired or just not knowing what to do. Like, kind of instinctively jumps for, uh, dives for a takedown from like four or five feet out. And Borix hits, I'm not going to call it the slowest flying knee ever, because it's not, but like, 
it was pretty obvious what he was going to do. Because <laughs> he jumps, like, he does that weird, like, the thing where he switches in midair. So, like, he'll throw the fir- he'll throw the right knee forward first, and then he'll follow it with the left knee. And that's the knee that caught Pico as he was, like, like, what, what would you call that shot? Because, like, I feel like, I feel like in the middle of the shot, he realized, uh-oh. Right. <laughs> because he, he didn't, like, fully lunge forward. He wasn't, like, mid-motion, and then it felt like he second-guessed himself. But by the time he figured out what was, it was happening, it was too yeah. late. So, um, Pigo gets knocked out in the second round of this fight. It is his second knockout in as many fights, I believe. If, and his third time he's been stopped in his seven pro fights. So... I'm kind of just hoping Aaron Pico goes and focuses on being in the on the 2020 uh, U.S. freestyle wrestling team for the Olympics. Because <laughs> I, I I don't need to see him get knocked out anymore. I'm good. Yeah, this this was um. Because I like the kid. Like he's a like he if you've ever seen him wrestle, it is fucking electrifying. Like, this is a 19-year-old kid who's wrestling, like, grown-ass men in 2016 and making them look silly. Like, we're talking NCAA champions. And Pico w- was not just hanging with them, but in some cases just, like, straight-up embarrassing them. But MMA is not his calling. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to be that terrible coach. That's not ready to throw in the towel yet. But I think... Oh, boy. I'm trying to defend this somehow. Well, not not trying to this, defend it. Because like, we, what, what, what happened, yeah, happened. Like, so, like, the way I look at it is, like... You're, you, the guy you invested all this money and, like, media time in just got knocked out fighting Henry Corrales. And I fight that he was, he was admittedly winning until he got knocked out. Mind you, it was less than, like, four minutes, but still. Um, why would you throw him in there with a guy who has a five inch height advantage who likes to throw like throw it who, who whose claim to fame in Bellator is basically just throwing knees like flying knees and like it is a finisher like Borg if nothing else is a consistent finisher why is he Pico's bounce back fight yeah, and like I, when he was going for the takedowns, I was like, all right, it's a cool approach, you know, because a lot of other fights we just kind of see him slug heavy shots, and you know, we we've seen you know, he he can put people out. But I'm like, all right, I like this new approach. You're mixing it up. You're doing something different. Great. I became worried when it just kind of similar to Chell, where it seemed like that was like all he wanted to do. Yeah. Like, it's one thing to, like, mix it up. Like, I'll strike a little bit, and then maybe, you know, I'll shoot in every once in so often to keep you honest. You know, maybe just mix it up. Make things a little interesting. But it seemed like he was, like, really just dead set on, I'm just going to wrestle this guy to death. And it was just like he became really predictable. It's like, all right, I know what he's going to do. He's He's not throwing hands like I thought. He's just trying to just keep taking me down. So... Kind of similar to Chill. If he keeps shooting, his head's going to be there to get need. <laughs> like, it's just, it's going to be there. And it's just like, I wish he just, this performance, I think, could have went another way if he just would have. It's like, <laughs> it's like when you play, like, a video game and you unlock a new move. Um, and you just want to do the new move over and over again. Albeit wrestling isn't a new move, obviously. We know what Pico's history is, but, like. We haven't seen him shoot much in MMA. So now he gets to wrestling going. It's like, all right, I just want to keep doing this over and over. And it's like, all right, I get that this is your thing and it's working, but you kind of still need to, you got to mix things up, man. You can't just keep doing this one thing over and over and think it's going to be sweet. Um, yeah, not a good <laughs> bounce back fight. Um, Wait, maybe Pico will be good at MMA one day, but... It won't be in Bellator because they are going to they they are going to fuck the whole like his whole career up. 
And maybe it's not them. Maybe it's Pico's team who's like, yeah, no, they're, they're the ones calling the shots being like, yeah, no, we want so-and-so, or we want so-and-so. Yeah, we want tough fights. Like, Pico's been like this since he got signed. Like, he, he wanted Zach Freeman, or he wanted somebody with a good record right out the gate. And, like, I feel Bellator's, like, in this weird position where, like, okay, you have somebody who's extremely marketable who caught people's attention, and we've been matching him up, like, he fought Lee Morrison in, like, his fourth pro fight and obliterated him. And people were like, yeah, Bellator's feeding him cans. But Lee Morrison's also, like, an 18-8 veteran journeyman who is probably way above who Pico would have been fighting if he had been fighting in, like, LFA. Like, he fought Leandro... He fought and beat Leandro Higo in his fifth pro fight. Like... There, 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 there's just a certain point where being like a super athlete just like it hinders your progress because it, it, you you speed through guys so quickly until like you find the guy who just is unimpressed by how athletic you are or, or how hard you hit. Yeah, he, yeah, his matchmaking, man. <laughs> like, and this is like. God, this is a guy that you don't like. Of all the guys to mess up your build up of like this could be somebody possibly could be like the face of our motion. Like you don't want this to be the guy you blow it on. Like you had something here. You definitely had. This guy was on like the front page of ESPN before he like, even debuted. You, right, you really had something going here. This is not the one of all the prospects. This ain't the guy you want to blow it on, man. Like, you messed this up. Because you're right. Like, if if they don't figure this out soon, and I almost wonder if it's, I don't know if it's too late, but if he does turn around and become the fighter that some of us think he can be, it probably won't be in Bellator. Like, Bellator will mess it up. He'll go to some other organization and maybe he figures it out there and they'll have like a star in their hands. And Bellator will be like, like, bro, that could have been, that should have been us. But it wasn't because we kept matching him up against people he probably just had no business being with. Yeah, uh, so. and I don't want to take away from Borg because, you know, highlight real finish, you, you, Killed a, a prospect, um, but I don't know. Just, it makes you just look at Bellator like, "Come on, guys!" Be like, <laughs> yeah, you can't. You're you're blowing the big one here, man. Like you you can you cannot mess this up. And I, I mean, Pico had the right idea from what I read when he was going to Jackson's. Kind of the same thing we said about um, we mentioned about Loretta. Like she needed to learn. Oh, not Loretta. Somebody else we mentioned about. Like he needs to learn how to fight. Not in the sense that he can't throw a punch, but like he needs to just understand fighting and you know, in, in like a technical aspect, just having better IQ, things like that. Like he needs to actually learn how to fight. So uh, the move is great, and I, you know, the, I agree with the mindset of you know, I, I need to learn how to really hone these skills that I have. But it's like I get it because you probably work with him in the gym. And, like, you just, you see the potential, you see how athletic he is, you see the gifts that he has, and I'll be, like, super excited. But it's like, dude, you still gotta, you still gotta ease him along, man. You cannot be rushing him into fights like this and have these kind of results. Like, I I would hate for us in maybe, like, two to three years, us turning back and looking at Aaron Pico and saying, what if? Like, I, I don't want to have that conversation a year or two from now. And I feel like that's the path that we're headed down. We'll be looking at people like, what if they would have built him up right? And what if X and Y would have happened? And Or even worse, <laughs> not even what if, he just becomes like a footnote. Like, we just forget about him. Right. Like, remember that Pico kid? Oh, yeah, yeah, he got knocked out, blah, blah, blah. And then we just kind of, you know, move move on to whoever's the next, you know, the next next big thing at the time. But, yeah. It yeah, sucks. Uh, it uh, sucks. Like, it does. Problems to Borix though, um, like, dude now is a, I don't know, like, like what he's four, four and zero in Bellator, all finished stoppages, like he is a, he is a, 
he's a factor now at uh, featherweight. Yep. Uh, I believe he's Gegard uh, Musasi's boy. Like, like he, he, that's how he got signed. Um, exciting dude. Would love to see him fight Corrales or uh, anybody in that top part of the Bellator featherweight division. So you gotta keep the line moving, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, good on him. He'll. I'm pretty sure his next fight will be a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty big. Maybe one. he'll be televised. Right. <laughs> You bring your bring your your flying knee to a televised primetime audience. Why wasn't this fight on like TV? Yeah, see, and that was my thought of like, like this could have been where the Danis and Humphrey fight was, and then my other thought was, well, maybe, you know, they they love Pico, but they're like, man, what if we don't, you know, what if he loses again? So they just stuff him on a prelim, like, you know, I I, I don't I don't know I don't know. Yeah. But, um. Weird. Boy. This sport. Boy. It will break your heart. It will break your heart. Over and All over. All the again. prospects lost. I have Phil Hawes won. Alright, Hawes won and Mix won, but he was a prospect fighting another prospect. So I guess they, like, evened each other out. But. Well, I don't know. Is, is Van Zant, would you consider a prospect? Well, maybe I mean, not. There's she, a lot of a the. She's a prospect in the sense that she is a Adam Weight in a. Like, she's a good. Adam Weight in the division that really doesn't have a hierarchy because all the fighters are split out across different continents. But yeah, no, like I mean, I guess Dylan Dennis won. Oh, oh yeah, I'll take that back. Not not all the prospects lost, but like the the big one that everybody's been hoping for to turn into something. Like not only did he lose, but it was like it was one of those losses where you kind of like leave a lot of the people that Bellator sunk money into was like Heather Hardy. And Darren Vico lost. Um, Darren Caldwell lost. Chael Sonnen lost. And then and retired it, without telling uh, Scott Coker that he was going to do it. Uh, so, it is what it is. And not only were they losses, but they were like bad losses. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. Whew. That was a. Uh, Bellator 222. It's a good <laughs> um, card. Yeah, it was. Like, and guess, you know, yeah, I'll, guess what's next week? Isn't Zombie back? It's Zombie with oh. Mikano, yes, over in the UFC, but Musasi is going to be fighting Lovato Jr. And Paul Daly is going hey. to be fighting Eric Silva. Hey, oh, no. Yeah, a little less. I, I can't. A, a little I, less stellar. Yeah, I can't. I, <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't give an A for that fight. Uh, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah Labiano versus James Gallagher, which is a fine fight. Um, if you're looking for, like, they, they got some, like, middleweight prospects in Mike Shipman versus Costello Von Stinas and Melvin Mayhoff versus Kent uh, Kapian, Kapian, which, whatever. I, I'm, I don't need to see Melvin Mayhoff fight anymore. <laughs> but, um, oh, little, uh, uh, Fabian little, Edwards. little Edwards is fighting. Yeah, Fabian's on it. Yeah, yeah, Fabian Edwards, K. Jackson, um, Walter Garzada. Galor Bufondo. Yeah, but Galor Bufondo. Uh, and Denise Keelholtz. And Charlie Ward. Aw, they have Galore and Charlie Ward and not making a rematch? What the bullshit <laughs> is that? <laughs> yeah, so that, next week's going to be, uh, it's going to be busy. Next week's going to be busy. Yeah, because both those cards are on the same yep, day. Yeah, and there's a glory card. Mm, so yeah, we'll have a lot to fight uh, talk about next week. Yeah, and then uh, the Korean Zombie fight. You got obviously a uh, Korean Zombie Moicano, Rob Font, John Lineker, Barbarina, Randy Brown, KGB Lee's fighting. Kevin Holland will be back against uh, Alessio De Chirico, uh Yeah. Dan Ige and Kevin Aguilar. Matt Wyman is back. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, Matt um, Wyman, our, uh, I'm who I'm still not convinced is a real person. <laughs> He's back against Violent Bob Ross. Arian Lipsky's uh, going to have her second go against Molly McCann. That's uh, a good fight. Uh, uh, DC's boy, Deron Wynn, making his debut against Bruno Silva. Andre Ewell's fighting. Um, yeah, so we're going to have a lot of um, be a lot of good good scraps going on next week. Nice scraps. Not a lot in terms of meaning or value. 
it's his division. Besides, I guess Mike Cano, Korean Zombie, but you know, if you're looking for some nope. just good time violence, it'll be some good time yeah. violence. Yeah, there'll be there'll be some here for you next week. Uh, who you know who's on real quick? Who's on the, the glory the glory card? Uh, I want to say it was Dumbe. 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 I'm really bad at names. Should be like what? But, should be like Glory. Sixty six. Harris. Uh, it is Cedric Dumbe versus Alim Nabiev, Anissa Mexin versus Sofia Olofsson, uh, Mohamed Mazari Meza- uh, versus Adam Hadfield, Felipe uh, Micheletti versus Luis Tavares, and Artem Vek- uh, Vakitov versus Donagy Abena. There we go. Um, Definitely, guys, watch the Dumbe fight. Dumbe fights are normally pretty, uh, especially lately, man. He's been, uh, he's been fighting like he's trying to prove something. Um, Aren't we all? Next, <laughs> right? <laughs> but he, he's been out there like he's trying to kill dudes. Uh, but nah, man. Yeah, I'm always down for a Dumbe fight. But yeah, next. So next week, man, uh, on the twenty second, there will be a lot of fisticuffs. So uh, get in where you fit in, and uh, watch watch people throw leather, man. It's gonna it's gonna be a good time. Yes. But uh, wait, there was, there was oh, Jermel Charlo's fighting next week. Hmm. So if you're into you know the Charlos, he's gonna be fighting. Uh, unless it's a rematch. No, no, he's fighting uh, Jorge Coda. So I think that's on Fox on Sunday. So if you're into that, that's a thing that's happening. There you go. Fist of cuffs everywhere next week. Yay! And Riggin does on the card. Big, big... Oh, the guy who fought on... Um, remember his name? Lomachenko? Freaking top. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's how he's remembered. Dude's a two-time Olympic gold medalist. <laughs> and, and boxed the crap out of Nunito Donaire, but he, he's the guy who quit against Lomachenko forever. So. Well, in, in, my, in my defense, <laughs> I'm not as knowledgeable as boxing uh, as I am in MMA. Uh, so no, no, it, it, it's names. fine. This, 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 is how bo- <laughs> this is how combat sports works. So uh, he, he he can't I can't blame anybody for remembering him for uh his most high profile loss or his his <laughs> most high profile performance period that poor forty year old man <laughs> but, yeah man so yeah next next week's gonna be we're gonna be really fun so you guys uh be on the lookout it'll be a, be a lot to talk about but. That's pretty much all we got uh, for today's episode. So go ahead and uh, close out with parting shots and shout outs. Um, I will only have one shout out. Uh, shout out to Jeremy Lin, man. Um, member of the Toronto Raptors, now an NBA champion, and he is the first Asian American to be an NBA champion. He joins the illustrious, um, the illustrious former Nick who went on to win a, a fucking title or world championship after he left the Knicks. So it's like him, <laughs> J.R. Smith. Uh, did Trevor Ariza win one? I want to say he did. I, I, they don't know if he has one. I could be making that up in my mind. Um, Came close. Der- like. Did Derek was Derek Lee there when they when Golden State started winning championships? Uh, I don't think so. I don't know. I, I can't confirm that. Point being, if you're a former Nick and you're not Carmelo, you might be on your way to winning a, uh, a NBA championship. <laughs> yeah. Shout, shout out to Jeremy Lin, man. Like he he had that stretch. I forgot what year that was, where he was like, you know, Lin sanity was a thing. And dude just managed to like keep his stock high and his name just kind of be out there. And you end up on Toronto, you get a ring. Um, and shout out to Toronto, man. Like they, even though I'm a Spurs fan, so this Kawhi thing, you know, I'm kind of. It's a weird situation. David Lee won a title. <laughs> 2015. Oh, <snap>. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, so that's the deal. You got to go to the Knicks, then leave, and then uh, good luck will be bestowed upon you. Yeah. But um, shout out to Jeremy Lin, though, first Asian American to win the title. Uh, that's an awesome accomplishment, and it was a great, great finals game, man. Really enjoyed it. This NBA, NBA season has been really fun Moscow uh, won to title. watch. Timofey huh? Mozgov won a title. 
Dude, Kyle Lowry is a champ. Dude, Kyle Lowry got rings before. Melo, CP3, James Harden, Russell Westbrook. The list goes on and on. Shout out to uh, uh, Mark Gasol, too. Him and Paul Gasol. Are, are they the first brothers to win championships, I want to say? I, uh, I, can't, I'm trying. I can't remember. I, I, if they're not the first, they're, they got to be in rare company. Right. I know that hasn't happened often. I want to say they're the first brothers to ever hold titles. Um, but I, I, I could be wrong. But shout out to Jeremy Lindo, man. First Asian American champion. Awesome accomplishment. Um... Yeah, man, this has been a fun NBA season. As a Spurs fan, it was kind of hurtful. We got put out early, but, you know, regardless, just as a fan of basketball, it, it was it was really, really fun to watch, man. Um, ba- basketball, NBA has been just really awesome these last couple seasons while I've been getting back into it um, a little more. It's been really, really fun to watch, but that's my shout-out, man, so congrats, congratulations to, uh, to Jeremy Lin. Yeah, um... If you're still in the, uh, if anybody out there is still in the mood for uh, basketball, WNBA season's in full swing. Um, my Liberty beat the Los Angeles Sparks yesterday, so I'm really happy about that. Um, but beyond that, shout out to um, so yeah, women's sports. Shout out to the FIFA, FIFA Women's World Cup, which is going on right now. And if you're not watching, you probably should be because it's great. Um you know, um, shouts out uh, to, um, oh, this woman, Olympia Asa in South Los Angeles. I was reading something about, um, she runs a, a health food spot. Like, I, I think it's like a little, um, it might be like a little corner stand um, called Supermarket, spelled without the E's. Um, and for those of the, like, There are areas designated in certain cities called food deserts where it's just super hard to get healthy food. Like, you'll have fast food joints, you'll have corner, like, you know, your your local corner store that has, like, you know, chips and shit, but it won't have, you you won't have, like, a a full-fledged supermarket. And in a city, it's super hard to find like a local it could be super hard to find like a local market i know like there are someone around here um so but you know she's out here trying to uh open up a restaurant not uh and a full-time like grocery store um doing it all independently she has like a gofundme or slash kickstarter page go get up her name is olympia asset a-u-s-e-t throw her some bucks if you can um you know, she she was she's from Slauson. She's she was inspired by Nipsey Hussle. Um, actually, her stand is on the same street where uh, his uh, his uh, his store is, the one where he got shot at it. So, yeah, so props to her. Um, props to um, I I have a whole list of shit here. Um, um the app C two five K. For the first time in my life, I ran like eight minutes, and I'm really ha- I'm really proud of that fact. Hey. Um, like it, 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 it it's um, it's an app designed over the course of two months to get you accustomed to running for thirty minutes, which is about not what which gives you which is like enough time to run a five k, which is about three point one miles. So like, if you're interested in you know b- building up your endurance, your stamina, do that. I'm on like week five or something. Um, I have to run 20 minutes tomorrow, and I'm kind of fretting that. Yeah, um, but yeah, I'm also kind of excited. It's got me. It, it, it's I'm not gonna say it, it hasn't gamified running so much as it just made running like tangible. Like okay, I only have to run at, at pace for a certain amount of minutes, and there's no like designation for how far after all so it's 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 way better than just running until like your back and legs start to hurt you feel me right because <laughs> that's always been like the major thing with me so props props they have it called c2 5k if you want to give it a shot it's free um i know they have like some like in-app purchases like you can buy like how far your distance is or whatever but there are other ways to track that 
Um, so yeah, shout out to the app. And um, I don't know. Shout out to New York. They just passed that uh, that rent control legislation, and they got a bunch of landlords angry. And I'm always happy to see a bunch of landlords angry. So. Did they like cap the rent? They they capped how much rent could go up every year. Hmm, okay. So. Yeah, New York. New York needs it. New York, <laughs> San Francisco, anywhere else is being gentrified to shit. Yeah, I feel like we all need it, but in states like, especially over there, where everything is just like crazy expensive, like yeah, they they definitely, definitely need something like that. Yeah. Oh, and one last one, um, just because, like, you know, we, we are small content creators, especially you, Sensei, with your published book and your interviews on PBS's blog. Hey, appreciate it. Um, but um, this dude named Felix Colgrave, he's an animator on YouTube. Uh, up until recently, he was like sustaining himself on like you know freelance work, stuff that it cost more money to actually make to actually make than it did to like that he was getting paid. But he, 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 like, if you ever seen like some of his stuff on YouTube, it's like great. Um, I, I recommend going up. Like he he did the um. The, Cypress, the recent Cypress Hill video, uh, Muggs is Dead. I need to watch that. Yeah. I need to watch that still. Um, he, he, he's, you know, so he, he is a fantastic animator. He just started a Patreon. It was really cool to see. Like, he started it, like, two days ago, and he already has, like, 2,000 patrons, which is crazy. But it, I just giving him a shout-out. Go watch his stuff. Go watch, uh, what was it called, Double King. It's great. I love animation. I wish YouTube was friendlier to animators and that they were able to actually make a living putting the stuff up online. But YouTube values bl- like vlogs and like, well, yeah, just mostly vlogs and like drama videos and like hate speech videos more than they do actual like talent. So it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to all the content creators. It is hard, like ridiculously hard, to make a living off of. Whatever it is your content is, because a lot of people, uh, aside from the platforms often not being friendly to it, a lot of people just don't feel entitled to pay content creators. Like they think it's just some free oh, yeah. thing that would just, and that that's a whole nother argument that I won't even get into right now. But uh, like if it I, takes I, I time and, and money and effort to put into it, like people like like especially in the internet era, we get lost in the um like, the ease of access to everything. Like, if you want to go play, like, The Witcher 3, you there, there you can literally go pirate it off of, like, like a million different websites or whatever. Right. But, like, especially with, like, these small one-man teams or one-woman teams or, like, like, people are putting their time and effort and resources into shit. Like, even if you can't spot them, like, a buck, you know, Drop a good word of praise, like pass it on to your friends. Like, you know, we're all trying to just sustain, you know? All right. And don't, uh, I'll close it out on this. Don't be that person. To ask for free shit. Who, when, not even that. The, well, yeah, definitely don't be that person to ask to do something for free. But it, it irks my soul when I see people like, oh, um, you know, I didn't, um, I shouldn't have to pay you. It's all about the exposure. Exposure don't pay bills, bro. I cannot. <laughs> I can't pay my car note with exposure. I, I need money. Pay me for my service. Exactly. Uh, you can keep, keep keep your exposure. You can keep that. <laughs> but um, my favorite was some dude who had like, like, cause I, like you read like I'm into knitting and like I read stuff all the time from people who are like. Who, who don't, like, sell their stuff, but, like, they post about it, and people come to them and ask, like, for people to make them stuff. And it's always, like, the most craziest shit. Like, some lady um, posted, like, about, like, you know, she made blankets and stuff. And, like, you know, I don't know if you know how much yarn it takes to make a blanket. It's a lot. Probably a lot. It's a lot. Like... We're we're talking maybe like a like a full queen size bed, probably a couple hundred bucks just in yarn. Um, dude came to her at, and was like, "I want it for like twenty bucks." Just like 
insane. Yeah, yeah get out of here. <laughs> Go to Amazon for your blanket or your quilt, whatever you want. Yeah, don't 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 come over here with that. And those things take like months to make. And that's a lot of labor and time that you're not getting paid for. Nobody's congratulating you. It's literally just you just taking out time out of your day. You could be doing a million other things, and you're choosing to, you know, do this. Respect my time. Pay me for my time. That's that's what it boils down to. Your job wouldn't come to you and tell you, hey, yeah, I know you've been working hard, but, yeah, we're not going to pay you. You would leave. So, But that's all we got. For today's episode so as always give us a listen soundcloud youtube itunes spotify google play send questions to dojo talk podcast at yahoo.com hit us up on social media at the dojo talk podcast facebook page as well as the instagram page and you can follow me on twitter and twitch at serial sensei once again man happy belated father's day to all you fathers out there hope you had a great weekend hope you have a good week we appreciate you and as always, anytime people are being punched and or kicked in the face, we will be there to talk about it. So until next time, we will catch you guys later. <laughs>